that's caused problems for one or two players, and um, that's what they've been doing. It's a bit of a fad, though, I think, don't you? Oh, I've got... Mr Saggers, I've got 30 seconds, so let me just say thank you to Isla Lones, Carla Battisti, Jack Thubrin, Finkley Knowles, Minty Gow, and Porrick Birmingham. They've been my great team uh, for the weekend. Uh, Mark, the wonderful Sunday night club with Mark Saggers is, is uh, coming up. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to sport. In the meantime, have a fantastic week. I'll see you same time, same place, Saturday and Sunday next week. Until then, that's it from me. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, treat Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the pan. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minute, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
show What Just Happened being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30. They go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Sick weekend of FA Cup football, hasn't it? It's uh, really been going. Uh, nip and tuck all the way and uh, what a win for Manchester United against Liverpool the seven goal thriller this afternoon and Manchester United will take on Coventry City who beat Wolves by three goals to two with some couple of really late goals as well so it's Coventry City against Manchester United and Chelsea beat Leeds 4-2 in the end after uh, Leicester City I should say uh, came back to draw with uh, Chelsea, but then Chelsea scored two very late goals. We'll be looking at all of the FA Cup tonight. We've got um, plenty more besides. There's uh, some really interesting stories, obviously, within football, what the Premier League don't want to do for the EFL with funding. Uh, we're going to be looking at all of that side of things. Gavin McGaw and Andrew Mills, amongst others, with us in the second hour of the show. We'll also be looking at Wickham Wanderers having bought Reading's a training ground and how that has gone down with both the Reading and the Wickham side of things. Pete Carvel has written a brilliant book called Death of a Boxer. He'll be joining us after nine o'clock. Um, we're rounding up the Six Nations with uh, Nick and George later on and uh, we're going to finish off with all the very latest on the golf. We'll keep you up to date with the players which uh, finishes today, of course, in Florida. First, though, to the football and first tonight to Manchester United against Liverpool. Manchester United winning it eventually deep into extra time with the fourth goal of the game from Diallo, who took off his uh, jersey to celebrate and promptly got a second yellow card and sent off. But there wasn't enough time for Liverpool to do anything, so the trebles and quadruples and all of that sort of stuff is out of the window for them. And two big semi-finals to come, which could lead to an all-Manchester final, or it could be CC, Coventry, City against Chelsea. Let's start with the game today then uh, at uh, Old Trafford. What a game it was too. And um, delighted to say that Slim Will Williamson is uh, with us. We're just waiting for Pete. He was a little bit out of the ground today. I'm not surprised as well. But um, Slim, I mean, you, you had it. You had the game in your hands on so many occasions and then somehow just managed to lose it. Yeah, how are you doing, Sagas? So you yeah, okay? I'm well. I'm well. Yes. Bad day at the office, I have to say. Terrible, terrible um, game management from us today. I think, like you said, we had the game in our hands at 2-1. Then we had it at 3-2 and yeah, individual errors cost us just not controlling the game. I mean, there were parts of the game where we had total control, especially start of the second half. It looked like the wind was knocked out of Man United sails well and truly. And we had opportunities to go ahead and score a third one just to put it to bed. But we just, I just, yeah, we just didn't manage the game well. We weren't ruthless enough, enough up front. I mean, there was a, a five on two at one point. And yeah, the pass from Gakpo to Elliot wasn't good enough, so that caused Elliot to stop. Yeah, it just yeah, it wasn't a great great day for us to be fair. And yeah, congratulations to United. You know they got the win at the end. We're pushing for the uh, goal before penalties come, and yeah, breakaway goal they score. Yeah, they did. I mean they they, they took the lead obviously uh, as well in the game, and uh, all the way through, it's the whole weekend has been a good one for the FA Cup, I think. Um, I don't know, you know, with no uh, replays and what have you, looks of it's going to come in very shortly, isn't it, for a, a lot of the matches eventually and, and where it goes. A lot of people will say it was an absolutely classic weekend of FA Cup football. Um, is it still right up there, do you think, or is it now w w we enjoy it, but it's it's not got the same gravitas that it had as far as winning this trophy is concerned? Yeah, I think... You in the earlier rounds, it doesn't have that same sparkle. I think once you get to the like the last eight and stuff like that, and you feel like you can win it, I think that's when it sparkles and you know the magic of, of the cup is there. And I think obviously it means a lot more to those teams who aren't fighting for much on the domestic front or even the European front. I think then that's when it has a lot more weight to it. But you know, I think 
yeah, so it's still a great cup to win. It's still another trophy at the end of the day. And obviously players are in the game to win trophies. So yeah, it's a trophy at the end of the day. But I do like the fact that there's no replays. I think we should do away with replays because I think then it puts more mm. onus on teams winning it first time round as opposed to, oh, we'll go for the replay and take them back to our place and that old adage. So yeah, I quite like like the no replay thing. Yeah, no, look, I'm absolutely with you on that. I think if there are to be no uh, replays as well, I think there has to be a, a sort out, particularly for smaller sides who get a long way in the competition and they're away from home to get a quite a quite a big amount of uh, the revenue from whether they're home or away. Yeah, it should. Yeah, especially the smaller clubs, the revenue should you know just get part of it because obviously you know you've got teams like United, Liverpool, City, big gate receipts, and you know you have your little clubs like Coventry and stuff who are still in it. You know they should they have a share of the money because I mean they put on the entertainment just like the other team do so yeah I agree there should be some sort of prize for them as well for turning up and playing. What about the Liverpool fans then um, it's not going to be a quadruple or anything such as that now but you know you're still f kicking on all different fronts here uh, the title is the real thing though isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think once the dust settles and, you know, <laughs> everybody uh, gets past all the banter messages they'll probably get when they get to work tomorrow, I think we'll look at it and think, yeah, the league is is the bigger fish. So that's what we should be concentrating on. I mean, we've got a very good chance of winning the Europa League. The draw has been kind to us. So, yeah, I definitely think it's, this is not too bad, to be fair. If I had to pick a cup to lose, <laughs> it would have been the FA Cup. So Yeah. yeah. And um, we've got a break now. Um, uh, it's an international break, it's friendlies for a, a lot of sides. I just don't know whether it, it gets in the way, but it, I, I suppose it doesn't really give players in, in your squad that much of a rest at all because most of them will be going all over the place. Yeah, I've never been a fan of the international breaks, like it's right in the middle of a season, especially with a season like this one where you've got such a close title race. You want the football to keep coming thick and fast. You don't want your players to go away on international duty and pick up any kind of knocks. You know, I mean, as a fan, sometimes you, you wouldn't mind if it was the opposition team, you know, OK, their best players out. But if you look at it as a football fan, you want all the best players to be playing so you, the games are of the highest quality so i've never been a fan of this international break in the middle of of the season um but it is what it is we are where we are let's just hope for us it's come at a good time because i think after the international break we're going to get quite a few players back so it gives us that last that big push at the end but yes yeah, it's, mm. it's just not necessary i think they should look at that and maybe decide to put them somewhere else where it doesn't interrupt in the season yeah, I don't really know. How, I, don't, I haven't got any sort of solution on, on that, particularly in what uh, is uh, another championship per year for international clubs. So it, 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 it is difficult. But I just do feel that in the end, we're going to, everybody's going to be running on empty here. And it could be by the last two or three weeks of the season. Yeah, exactly that. It's going to take out of them. I always thought with the internationals, I mean, yeah. If they didn't have so many international breaks, what do we have? Two, three international breaks during the season? I can't, I can't remember the number off the top of my head. If you got rid of all of those international breaks, the, the Premier League would finish sooner, and then you could have some friendly games at the end of the, the season leading up to a tournament. So I think that would work a bit better. And then obviously clubs wouldn't be worrying about players going away. I mean, you've got players like Ben White, who's asked not to be part of the England squad. And I'm sure that's more due to you know, where Arsenal are in the league and his form he figures he doesn't want to go away and anything happened to him. So, yeah, I feel it's something that they could look at, they could do, do something about. Whether they will or not is a whole other ball game. Mm. Well, Slim's, uh, it's great to talk to you, but Pete's uh, taken his time to uh, get out uh, of the ground. So um, we're going to be uh, talking to him in a short while. Uh, I know it's been, it's always great to talk to you. Final, final thoughts, Slim. Uh, of this uh, game, you've got that one out of the way. Um, Manchester City still involved in just about everything as well. It, it, it is going to be a, a really tight finish to this season at the top. Yeah, I think everybody needs to just buckle in because it's going to be a wild ride. The last, what, 10 games of the season? Yeah, it's going to be very, very hair and scare them. There's going to be wins, losses and draws. And I think the, the league... The number one position is going to change hands a few times before we get to May the 19th. But I'm still tipping Liverpool to win it. I think we'll we'll lick our wounds tonight and we'll come back stronger after the international break. Brilliant stuff. Slim Williamson from the Anfield South podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Look, we'll take a quick break here and then we'll come back and talk more of the other football in a short while. Hey. 
day. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, a very good evening uh, to you for just joining us uh, here at the moment, waiting to speak to Pete uh, Molyneux, uh, the Manchester United fan for over 60 years, who's uh, been at the game today and it's been a great occasion for them. And Manchester United will play Coventry City in the semi-final of the FA Cup with Manchester City up against Chelsea. Just to let you know that West Ham and Aston Villa were playing in the Premier League this afternoon. It finished one apiece at Antonio um, getting the West Ham goal and uh, Aston Villa getting back into it could have gone either way bit of controversy at the end and when we're speaking to uh, Keith uh, Hackett and Mark Halsey uh, we'll look at uh, one or two uh, VAR decisions in that little uh, lot as well are we able to go to um, Manchester United so we're not quite ready to go to uh, that at the moment uh, I do apologize uh, for this. Um, let me tell you a, a little bit more about what else we've got in the show. In the second hour of the programme tonight, uh, Andrew Mills and uh, Gavin McGall will be joining me. We've got to look more now on uh, exactly what's happening with the Premier League, with the negotiations for the EFL, uh, a funding stall by the Premier League. It's um, been big news this week and we'll get some expert uh, thoughts on that. And Leicester City's uh, points deduction as well with the others. It's becoming a real mess as far as I'm concerned, all of this. Um, I don't want to, I don't really want to see this sort of thing happening during the season. We need it all sorted off season. If something has got to happen and all the clubs involved that are problem, then uh, that's what we have to do. Right. Well, Pete Molyneux finally has made it uh, back from uh, Old Trafford. Good evening to you, Pete. 
Good, good evening, Mark. Apologies for my tardiness, but I, I, I have no re regrets. It's fine. <laughs> it, absolutely. Um, it was a great game today, and to be fair to Slim, he was um, very magnanimous in uh, defeat, and uh, you had you had plenty more chances as well, and at one stage it looked as if um, you were all going to think Rashford can't get those shooting boots on today and we, we're going to miss out here. Oh, de definitely. I mean, a really strange game. I thought we started as I expected us to, just the opposite of last week against Everton, where we're on the front foot today. Crowd was up for it. And uh, and we helped we put Liverpool on the back foot. That was for about 30 minutes. For the next 40 minutes, Liverpool just, I thought, slowly but steadily dominated it and got the goals. And I, I, was, I was thinking about my excuses and what I was going to say to you. Well, you haven't needed to do that in the end. I mean, first of all, uh, 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 for, he's only scored in the FA Cup, hasn't he? Who, who's that? Antonio has only scored in the FA Cup. Oh, oh yes, yeah, the, yeah. Um, I mean, to be fair to the, the manager, who's under a lot of pressure, but his substitutions today in the second half were superb. Anthony came on and did it. Ahmad came on and did it. Harry Maguire played like the captain that Bruno should have been playing like. And uh, Ericsson as well. So... Uh, it, it, it really changed it. In fact, I think just talking to the, some of the fans I walked back with, we're all still processing it, process it in our heads. Not that we've won or beaten Liverpool. That's great. And, and that we're at Wembley for the semi. But because it seemed so lost, it seemed like a lost cause, Mark, halfway through that second half. Yeah, they sort of suddenly went to sleep again, Liverpool, because they were in control. They, they, they were, and we weren't laying a glove on them, you know. But um, I think I think Maguire and Anthony, it, it brought the team to life. It brought the crowd back to life again. And uh, absolutely incredible game. I mean, I've, some, I've, seen, I've been blessed to see some great g games in my time just against Liverpool. But 4-3 at Old Trafford in the sixth round. Wow, just something so special. And um, it could still be... Um, with all due respect to both Coventry City and Chelsea, uh, an all-Manchester final at Wembley. But Coventry City uh, have deserved to be where they are, particularly with that result against Wolves. Oh, it was superb. I sat down and watched the second half yesterday and it, and it was riveting. Um, I mean, that's been two superb uh, games. I've only seen the United one and the Coventry one, but I thought Coventry deserved that. They had the never say die spirit. Really pleased for Mark Robbins because of his history and what he's done as a manager. Um, no, no. Well, good luck to him, but not now. We've got them in the semi. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. What about everything else that uh, is going on now? Does will it be a successful season? Do you think if you can go all the way in this one and 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 do something else and 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 still have a good run to finish this season with? De definitely. This, this has bought Eric Ten Hag more, more time. He had time as far as I was concerned, but it starts to get desperate. This, I feel, Mark, is exactly where Fergie was in 1990. Mm -hmm. He'd had a, a horrible season with injuries and a dreadful winter, and he hung on in there, winning each, each cup game, you know, just by the odd goal. Um, and it does buy you time. We'll take a Wembley day out, uh, semi, but also final. So, it buys him time to get to the close season and then he's got to weave his magic, I think, Ten Hag and get the right players. I don't think we need a lot of new players, just some mm. key players, particularly in midfield. And it could set up a long career. Uh, so it really, today, could have been a bit of a snake or a ladder and thankfully at the moment it's a ladder. And just as you were saying there, you know, you're, the, the, the Old Trafford faithful talking about the season and where you are now and, and what is happening you said that you you always thought uh, Ten Hag should carry on and uh, complete the job that he wants to do over the coming seasons. Do, do you think that he's winning fans round? He will with performances like we close with today. The bit in the middle, it, again, it wasn't just that we were we were losing; it was the way we were playing. We, there was no there was no real fight, and you can't you can't have that at Old Trafford. Yes, it. It, it, it will win. This team will grow in confidence the further he gets in the cup. So, yeah, I, I'll say he can turn it round. I, 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 I'm always the optimist, Mark, so I'll, I'll go for it, yes. I'll say he will turn it round and uh, winning the cup would be great and then we could have a go at the league next season. But I'm not going to put my house on it. <laughs> uh, Slim, it's been... Uh, uh, it was great to talk to Slim earlier. Shame you couldn't do the two of you tonight, Pete, but thank you very much indeed, uh, as always. Manchester United through to the semi-final of the FA Cup against Coventry City.
It's uh, Manchester City against Chelsea. Um, Chelsea themselves uh, beat Leicester City. They they did it once more the hard way in the end. Let's speak to uh, Chris Forrey and Leicester till I die. Not to be, but at one point, getting it back to 2-2, it looked, Chris, as if uh, Leicester City were going to cause another embarrassment at Stamford Bridge. It was a full-blooded FA Cup match. Um, it could have gone either way. I mean, 2-0, uh, in fairness to Chelsea, I thought they'd probably go on and win it easily. Uh, but they did their best to help us out. You know, an own, an own goal and a missed penalty. Um, they, you know, they were giving us every chance. And look, we got it back to 2 all. You start to dream. But it, 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 it was 4-2 in the end, as you said. Two very, very late goals in, in injury time. Um, they they needed it, I think, more than we did because this is their season, hangs on this. Uh, we've obviously got other fish to fry uh, with the trying to get promoted. Uh, and, of course, if we'd got to just a small matter of Manchester City in the semi. So <laughs> maybe they did us a favour. I don't know. But, look, we... We didn't. We didn't embarrass the championship. Um, I know there are rivals, but good luck to Coventry flying the championship uh, mm. flag. Uh, and I think, you know, we played three championship teams this year. Um, Liverpool in the Calibre Cup, who beat us three-one. Uh, although that was a tight game. Uh, Chelsea just now four-two. Probably two teams that if you went, if we were in the Premier League, we went to their grounds, we wouldn't necessarily expect to beat them. You mm. can't necessarily judge us. But Bournemouth, again, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. We beat them. Um, and I think it, it you know, looks good for us if we, if we get promoted uh, this season. Well, looking at that at the moment, you're still uh, top of the shop, aren't you? You've got to your point ahead of Ipswich, who've found form again, a terrific uh, win for them against struggling Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, I'd, by I'd, six I'd goals to, to say nil. we were, but I think Leeds may have gone above. No, of course by one they goal. have done today. Of course yes. they have by goal. You're absolutely <laughs> yes. right. But Leeds, Leeds and Leicester, two mm. sides, um, very much. Uh, th well, I think it's between the three sides, if I if I'm honest, and and the likes of Southampton, West Brom, and Norwich, and uh, possibly even Hull are looking at uh, places in the playoffs. Mm. But um, certainly Leicester, Ipswich, and uh, Leeds. And what what about the break? I mean, we talk about these breaks. Um, England have got to play Brazil. Um, there's all sorts of other bits and pieces uh, going on. Is it is it a good time to have a break or or not really? It's, it's a weird time to yeah. have one, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know we all we you know I'm, I, I literally was doing the fixtures earlier. We've got nine games left. Leeds have got eight. Ipswich have got eight. Last thing we want, if you've got any momentum building. I mean, to be honest with you, for us, it's probably come at a good time because Leeds have just gone top, uh, albeit by one goal. Psychologically, they look at the table and quite rightly they see themselves there. So actually having that break may just take the sting out the tail a little bit with that. Uh, but no, it's it's a, it, overall, it's a ridiculous time. We, then when you look at it, we, we, we play on the 29th of March, the 1st of April, the 6th of April and yeah. the 9th of April. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. No, it is ridiculous. And that's when you can pick up two or three late injuries that can really mm. ruin the rest of the season. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But, you know, we, we, we are but mere football fans. <laughs> and you know, mere, what do football fans and clubs matter in the great scheme of things? Uh, <laughs> well, well, there we are. Uh, we could that could be another whole topic for another night. But it's great yeah. to talk to you, uh, Chris. Um, we're yeah, going to talk to the Chelsea on. side of things now. Uh, Louis Benaventi is uh, with us as well. Uh, Chelsea Echo. And, well... In the end, in the end again, it's that sort of season, really, isn't it? Don't 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 remind me, Saggers. I am. <laughs> oh, honestly, I think I had a few years knocked off of me in those last eight minutes. Um, to, I I mean, look, I, I can I can be honest, and I, or I can you know sit there and be like, oh, we won, it's great, it's fantastic. We were poor in that second half. We were so poor, and we um and to be like, look. People can look at stats and say Leicester only had five shots. The possession was only X, Y, and Z. It was a basketball game. And mm. to be honest, realistically, if you look at games played on paper, like we're talking about with the stats, Chelsea should have been seeing that game off. By the end of the first half, we were 2-0 up, cruising, probably should have been 3-0 up. And then the uh, curse of the Mauricio Pochettino team talk arrived yet again. Mm. And uh, we seem to just fall apart. Um I don't know what it is. I, I don't know 
why it happens. We got away with murder, quite frankly. Um, I'm, I'm happy we're into an FA Cup semi-final, don't get me wrong, but hmm. you know, it's not just about reaching that game. It's the case of, well, how did you get there? And if we were playing better opposition, quite frankly, all, all due respect to Leicester, of course, you know, if we were playing better opposition, we would have been spanked in that second half. And, <laughs> and you know, it's the same story over and over. When you have that result happen where you're saved by brilliance rather than tactical nous, it says a lot. You know, we were drawing 2-2, a game which we were cruising. You'd expect your manager to be on the touchline sort of trying to get people going. Mm. Mauricio Pochettino is just so placid, just so uncharismatic, quite frankly. And I mean, look, I've been blessed throughout my lifetime of, of seeing some fantastic managers mm. at Chelsea. And it is a very different club now. I'm not going to sit here and say the Chelsea of old. I'm not going to sound like Arsenal fans or Liverpool fans from years gone by. No. We're in a completely different stage. But my word, just just a little bit of character, a little bit of something just to, to push these young players, just sort of get the best out of them would, would be lovely because there's so much more for them to give. And I just think, you know, today was just a, another example where it papers over some rather significant yeah. cracks. Yeah, what, what, one thing on that as well. I mean, this uh, this ability to um, uh, let other sides back into the game has been a real theme for Chelsea this season. What, what are, where are they going wrong? What are they doing wrong? Is it is it that they 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 lose concentration, that they take their foot off the gas? Uh, what is it? I, I genuinely think it's an experience. That's I think I guess that's an easy way out in some cases for me to say that. I mean, you and I have had this conversation, God knows how many times <laughs> over the past eighteen months, but it's kind of a case of we're looking at it, and I, I just think it's just an overarching ineptitude i think i'm trying to find a better word but there, there isn't one mm. you know I, th I think the the from the top down to the bottom of the club right now unfortunately there is a, a significant lack of experience and it's trickled onto the pitch you know these are the sort of games where you know i was i was sitting and watching it and i made the joke but we all kind of roll our eyes because we thought it was true we we'll sit there and going don't worry guys you know if we lose the game today uh, we'll sign a 12-year-old from Colombia for £150 million pounds and that'll fix our problem of uh, of the lack of experience in this team. When the reality is what we need is 26, 27, 28, probably even 31, 32 year olds. I'm talking, you know, old school. So I'm talking to you, Argo Silver-esque, you know, get, get me someone on a free who's, you know, mm. at the back end of their career but can help these young players do well and develop. Um, we, we just need a spine so these young players can actually, you know, reach their potential. You know, it's all well and good talking about potential and portfolios and basically treating young players like it's, you know, a house when the reality is it's not. Mm. Um, these are people. And it, it just shows with the, the lack of understanding throughout the club, even from the CEO. You know, there was the news that came out, obviously, in his first week where he was talking about how people were annoyed when he referred to Premier League fans and football fans as customers yeah. and the Premier League as a product. Um, and it, look, it is. We're going to be honest. The Premier League is a product. But there's a bloke who sits two seats away from me in his 70s who's been coming to Chelsea for years and years and years. He comes down from Newcastle every home game. In midweek games, he gets a hotel just so he can come and watch the football. He, he these, This isn't a customer. This is so much more to a lot of people. But yeah. it just goes to show the level of understanding at the elite level of the game right now is is diminishing at the major clubs. Um, and it's it, it, uh, down to people to change that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pathetic, to be honest. I won't just say it's it's Chelsea either. I mean, you've, let, let's remember, most of these squads have squads of 40, over 40 players. A lot of these players out on loan. A lot of these players never see a see a chance on the bench or anything. I, th I think that there's there's got to be something that changes with all of this because um, there, there are a, a lot of players who are just drifting through a career having got paid an awful lot of money but not really played. Mm. Well, yeah, it's... it's This this whole model with Chelsea makes no sense. Mm. Um, I, I, look, I appreciate there's some fantastic quality out there, but I was ironically someone saying this again earlier, sort of, they said it's, it's like penny stocks. You know, Chelsea can sort of invest as much as they want into the penny stocks, but only two or three out of 20 are going to come off. Yeah. So why are we just solely focusing on that? You know, we, we should be looking at, you know, the safer bets in some cases. And also paying 105 million for players who aren't ready. 
look, I appreciate in some cases they might be ones that can develop, but £105 million is what you pay for a marquee signing that's going to make an instant difference. Mm. And I think there's a lot of players in that team who some have made a difference, but not the difference we expected them to. Mm. And uh, hopefully they realise that this method doesn't work at an elite level, at the top level. You know, we've got... We're, we're signing Brighton level players, all due respect to Brighton, they might be doing well. They haven't done too well in the Premier League, but that looks going under the radar quite evidently in some cases. Mm. Was it eight wins in 21? I saw something before last week. Mm. And um, people look at that and sort of go, oh, we're signing this level of quality a player. What the reality is, again, just without trying to sound like an old school Arsenal or Liverpool fan, this is Chelsea Football Club. There's a sense of, 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 of pride here, of when you sit at that top table, you don't want to get down from it. And Todd Bowley and Bedek Bali came in and said, we want to be on that top level. We want to be winning trophies. Well, if you want to do that, stop behaving like it. Because yeah. right now we aren't behaving yeah. like a major player. No. And there's a, there's a reason we're sat in 11th in the league. Yeah, well, it's uh, it, whatever they say, it's uh, it's not been a great start for them and not a great season as well. I think, is Chris still here? I can see him on the picture. Chris? I think I am. Good yes. man. Um, yeah. Just one thing for you as just well. Just, I mean, enjoy, if in... just enjoying the Chelsea fan imploding, to be honest. Yeah. With <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Leicester City, um, are you happy that to go back to the Premier League straight away? Have you enjoyed, if you do go back, have you enjoyed the Championship? Has it refreshed a lot of you as fans? I, I, I love the Championship. Uh, and one of my best friends is, is a Burnley fan who obviously went through this last season. And they said, you know, he said, you'll love it when you come down here. But of course, we want to be in the Premier League. Of course we do. That's, you know, that's where any club, you know, wants to be. But, you know, <laughs> the obvious thing is no VAR. It's brilliant. I mean, you know, yeah. that, that that wait for the VAR today, whether it was a penalty or not. It's none of that. If it's a penalty, it's given. If the linesman puts his flag up, it's offside. If he doesn't, let's go and celebrate the goal. It's brilliant. And, you know, you can put tackles in and, and, and you know, it's like it's like proper football used to be. Um, but that said, yeah. Being in the Premier League, you you even if it wasn't the Premier League, even if it was the first division. Mm -hmm. You ask where you want to be as a football club. It has to be. Mm. I just um, uh, wonder as well, uh, if I can, uh, Louis, with uh, a, a thought that if you don't actually finish and, and get anything this season again, whether they'll just sort of try and do something else that's a bit silly and a bit different because they... They, they're, they're really trying to manage uh, uh, the, the club, Chelsea, financially, as far as I can work out with all these players. It's just as if, as if money can do something um, without them actually caring about where these state of readiness for these players to play in the Premier League is and how long it is going to take. I, I, I honestly don't have an answer for you on that i i could not tell you what the the situation's going to be um i i i i just hope they understand that they've made a mistake in some cases um i look at uh as an example of it i think obviously they had their uh, owners before fsg who mm. you know weren't managing the club well fsg came in realized they also weren't managing the club that well and adapted and obviously we saw the the level of success that Liverpool have had over the past few years because the best form of revenue in football and the best form of marketing, which is something they always moan about, is winning. Mm. And you can add all your toys as much as you want about, you know, we want to be better by having film uh, guerrilla marketing in the stadium, yeah. having this, having that, it's lovely, oh, look how amazing we are. Um, no one's going to care if you're sat in 11th in the Premier League. Um, and there are players in that squad who comfortably could be in other sides, on the fringes, maybe on the bench, starting in some cases, and you'd see the level of quality within that team I mean, it, and it, how they improve yeah. it. And just one more on that with, I mean, Pochettino. Uh, do I feel right that whatever they say, let's say they finish where they are at the moment, you don't actually make it through to the final of the... FA Cup and uh, beyond, uh, does, his, does he lose his job as a matter of fact because that's the way that these businessmen work? Uh, no. I think that his, his big thing was that he 
improve the level of quality with the player and they wanted him to improve uh, the position in the league. And they, I think the third thing, which actually might be his undoing, is the relationship with the... No real effort, really, for me to, to sort of make a connection. Um, but that that's the only thing that could be his undoing. I, I think, look... They're very data driven, uh, the this ownership and how they want to do things and the data in terms of the most important one on the league table and you know where we're sitting is, is on an upward trajectory. So, you know, realistically I, I think he'll, he'll he'll probably stay next season. Um I could sit here and tell you what I feel could happen, but the reality is that yeah. what I th- feel could happen and should happen probably won't. Um, purely because it would mean removing the sporting directors and players now who are far out of their depth um, and getting in a manager who might not be necessarily a project for 10 years but someone who knows how to win and can put a DNA into the club and into yeah. these young players to really imprint and push forward but look re- I think I think a lot of fans pers- well personally from where I'm, I'm, I sit and around me uh, have a, a massive disconnection and don't really resonate with Mauricio Pochettino at all Um and others, you know, are just looking at going. Look, he's a football guy. What, what would you do? Change yeah. the manager again? How does that work? Yeah, uh, it's 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 a mess. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it is a mess at Chelsea, and it's uh, a mess that uh, we'll be following right to the end of the season as well. We're going to talk to Keith Hackett, Mark Halsey next. There's been some more big decisions made over this particular weekend. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Well, there's uh, going to be a bit of a break, isn't there, with uh, the international football and international refereeing, of course, uh, in a different way. Surprised that many people that we, we still do f try and fit all of these games in at this stage of the season because everything in just about every league is absolutely delicately poised and a lot of players um, will uh, not get the opportunity uh, until Easter. And then it's about, as we were hearing earlier, four or five games in the space of ten days, something like that while they twiddle their thumbs in the uh, lower divisions as well, with one or two sides having players going all over the globe. Keith Hackett is with us, and so too is uh, Mark Halsey. Good to have you back, Mark. Good evening, Mark. Yeah, good evening, guys. I've yeah. uh, just walked through the door, not happy with my team. Lost 2-1 today, and been, just come back from Aspe, so we shouldn't have lost, so I'm not happy. Oh, well. Anyway, <laughs> move on. What, yeah, well, uh, what about... I'm, uh, not, happy the, I'm one not happy with the referee, Mark. I'm not happy with the referee. <laughs> <laughs> there was okay. one or two, uh, one or two strange decisions again uh, over the weekend. Actually, one today that really took some sorting out, and I didn't think they were going to. Was the, the 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 ball across the line, or was it a handball that pushed it in? Did you see that earlier on? Yes, I did, Keith. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what really took uh, the time. I think they wanted to confirm if the ball had been handled. Of course, uh, if the ball struck the hand or arm, either accidentally or or on a purpose that goal is then disallowed Loud, uh, yeah. you can't score with an accidental handball yeah well, well, well we saw the same with uh sims yesterday didn't we? in the in the walls commentary i mean what a what a what a game that was yeah. what an absolute that's what the fa cup's all about isn't it and but it yeah. took what four minutes to decide um because it, it wasn't conclusive so if it's taking that long just give it after a minute if you can't tell after a minute then give just give the goal Mm. Why are we taking so long? Yeah, I, 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 I do. Four minutes to say it's four minutes to say it's inconclusive. Well, you can see that before uh, within yeah. a minute. Yeah. Well, I do I think, think I do think that if they're going to persevere with VAR, then they've got to put some form of time limit on. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's it must be awful sat or stood in the sta stadiums waiting for a goal being either chalked off or on. Um, you know, and, and in fairness, that particular game, again, I thought the referee, Sam Borat, this young referee, mm. is actually nailing his performances. He's doing really well. Uh, and it's yeah, good. It's, game, it's yeah. good that we've got some fresh blood. And <laughs> and he referees the game low-key, and he allows the game to breathe. He's not, right. you know, he's, he's not wanting a war with the players. He wants no, to just, work with them. Uh, Keith, I think that with Sam, I think he reminds me of myself. He's a players referee because he talks, he engages with the players. He talks to the mm. players. He gets the mm. respect. Mm. And that's, that, that helps massively. It, it, yeah. it, it is very important. And particularly for all referees. If, show, give me your, both of you your, your experience now. I'll come to you first, Keith, here. We've got an international break. And then after that, we're sort of full on towards the end of the season. And some really key moments for clubs of survival or to go on and win something. And, and this really must be, for referees, a time when they have to be at their very best. There's no question that uh, these big decisions that they get wrong, Mark, uh, can impact negatively on whether a team is going to retain its position in the Premier League or not, or, or lower down. So there is pressure on the referees, but... You know, I know, for example, that Mark and myself as referees, we thrived on pressure. We actually put pressure on ourselves because we didn't want to make a mistake. You know, and the other side is we don't want referees to fatigue. I think one of the great things today about this wonderful game involving Man United and Liverpool was actually John Brooks because he adopted low-key. I think that was, in a way, the the... the the players themselves are to be complimented. I, I think it was the least aggressive semi-final or game that I've seen in years with involving Manchester United and Liverpool. And and I think Brooks had a, had a, a really good game. Um, didn't need the VAR, uh, mm. thankfully. Um, but, I'd like to see know, the but, Lord. Yeah. Well, well I, think, like I think we'll look at that. I'm giving... Uh, you know, look, they were looking for a foul... I'm, I'm thinking, well, we've seen worse fouls in the Premier League not punished. And, it, and yeah. it's, that, it's that level of consistency that you want in match officials, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think 
listen, I mean, the player's already on a yellow card, okay? Yeah. And he scores a, uh, you know, a, a last gust winner in a massive. I mean, I've refereed these games, and they are they are massive games. Every game's a massive game, but you know, 120 minutes, he scores the winner. He's already been cautioned. I mean, the player's being a bit bit silly, isn't he? Really, but. I mean, I'd like to see the law changed on, on that matter because we're in the entertainment business. That's what it's all about. That's what fans go and see. That's what players do. They celebrate. Now, if there's a political slogan on underneath his shirt or there's something that shouldn't be, then fine, yellow card. But when a player takes his shirt off to celebrate a goal, there's, there, I think we should... I think I'd like to see the law changed regarding that matter. I really do. Is I mean, I'm with you, Mark. I think the referee on this occasion... He's got to apply law. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's no, there can't be criticism in that area. No. But you know, there are times as a referee when you see, and there's times when you don't see, mm. in in a practical I, sense. And you yeah. and I, Mark, would not have seen that. We would have, we would have um, got yeah. our backsides up the field of play, knowing that you did not want the 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 second yellow or red card to come. I think it's just yeah. common sense that. No yeah. longer we see in the game. Okay, we can bl blame the player, but look, yeah. they've sc he scored the winning goal. The uh, passion uh, is uh, electric. Uh, but I'm with I you. Agree. I agree. I think we've got sometimes as referees, we've got to show a little bit of empathy for the game. Empathy yeah. for the game. Mm. And I'm, I would say, Keith, I would have most probably taken the rap off of you for not applying law in that situation. I would have turned yeah. the other way and just walked back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, I'm, think, I, I actually I, don't agree yeah. with either of you. No, you wouldn't, would you? No, but I don't. I don't. I don't on the shirt issue at all because you. We all know that that, that there were okay. There might not be a political slogan, but there will be all sorts of other bits and pieces. Now there'll be players taking their shirts off the whole time. They'll have a new advertising slogan no, yeah. on the under vest and everything. No, but they no, will. No, they don't. They, they don't will. Because if, and if they do, they get a yellow carpet. No, but but yes, yeah, so they look so, at it now. So you no, might as well no, just no. keep keep no. your shirt on. Yeah. No, if you see it now, yeah. they all have the same colour as their shirts on underneath. No. Yeah. It's we like, it's like the ripping. We were talk, I was talking earlier to Trish Hunt, although we didn't have long, about the, the ripping that we saw, first of all, at the World Cup with these socks and everything yeah. to, to sort of ease the pressure on the calf or whatever it yeah. is. Hey, my players do that, Mark. <laughs> they cut the yeah, socks. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I mean it's, I know. All, it's all rubbish. It is, I agree. Well, I, I, look, I'm not disagreeing with you, Mark. I think that. <laughs> You, I think there's more important things. I think if you went, if you go back to that Chelsea Leicester game, yeah, where you had Chelsea in blue, Leicester in black, and I guess if you were watching on TV as I was watching, I've got reasonable eyesight, distinguishing the players mm -hmm. at a snap wasn't yeah. easy, yeah. and that makes life difficult for the for the spectators. And come on, Premier League, there are pe there are people out there that are colour blind. And distinctive colours are so important. On that one, uh, if you remember, uh, Andrew Madley, who again I thought had a reasonable game, pulled out a yellow card and awarded a penalty kick. And I'm thinking that incident's outside the area. It's not in. It's not followed through. OK, maybe I've got a better view than he had on television. Mm. But it seemed to be a bit of an age before they corrected it. And sadly, the guy got a red card and... Uh, a free kick outside the penalty area, which Ryan Sterling shot in a direction that was nowhere near the goalpost. Uh, but <laughs> these are the issues that referees face, this application of a degree of common sense and application of law. Mm. But on this occasion, I thought that this was a decision that referee and the VAR eventually got to the right call, which is what we want VAR to do. Yeah. Seeing that it appears that nobody's going to get rid of it, Mark. No, they're not. No, they're not. I don't know why they're not, but they they, they say it's, it's going nowhere. It's going it isn't nowhere. going anywhere. But they, something's got to go somewhere uh, because <laughs> yeah. we got to have, we we can't have another season like this with all these different uh, oh. decisions and the, and the way they're going. Look, I think um, um, I think Steve's Steve evening manager, wasn't he? Steve, um, he was going on about referees at the weekend, wasn't he? Yeah, loads of, loads of people have uh, going on yeah. about referees at the moment. But, I mean, it's not any... I mean, it's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? I mean, you're the, you're, you're the referee of the game, but you're not, if you, you know what I mean. And that, yeah, yeah, I, that is yeah. a problem. Yeah, and and what we've seen and we, we, we continue to say is that... I use, the, I use the phrase, a lazy referee. 
because I think yeah. what they're doing is there's an over-reliance on uh, the VAR. We used to, in my era, we used to say these referees that used to referee to the to the assessor in the stand mod. Yeah. And, and, and people used to say to me, what do you think of the assessor? And I went, I don't know who he is today. I, I don't, I'm not interested in him. He's not refereeing the match. Mm. And I think this is the attitude that might might feel a degree of arrogance, but I think it's the attitude referees have got to, to have. And I think this is what Sam Borat does. I think as a young mm. referee, he goes, well, out, he goes, I'm making the decisions. There's no right, hesitation. Yeah. I mean, we, I think... We buy into that. I think Brentford could feel well agreed yesterday of not getting the, the get, getting the oh. uh, the penalty on mm. for was it um, but B- B- Burnley. I mean, absolutely rugby oh. tackled him to the didn't he? I mean, I, I, the referee's got to be seeing that. And yeah. why have VAR not getting involved? Yeah. I, it's just so many inconsistencies. It's all over the place still. Yeah, no, it is. What about international uh, breaks then, Mark? I'll come to you here first. Is it was it a, a, a good change? Have you got an opportunity to go and, and referee a big game in, uh, even if it's a friendly? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you you, you do you do get guys being on the FIFA list. You do you do get um, games. Um, sometimes sometimes you do wish you didn't have a game because it was it's just a chance because you know there's, there's so much pressure on you as a referee, and you do get. You do get mentally tired, you do get fatigued, and sometimes it was nice just to, you know, go away for a few days, get away, get away from it, and then come back recharged. Because when you go on these, when you go on international duty and and for for UEFA, it's it, it, it's three days, but it's very very tiring. You know, it's very tiring because you're on a you're on a plane or maybe two planes. You know, you, you stop off somewhere at a hub, and then you get another plane to where you're going. Then you get there late, and then you. You have some dinner, then you you go to bed. You're up early, and then you, you you know you referee the game, and then you don't get back till late, and you up you know really early in the morning to catch your flight home. So it is very mentally yeah. tiring. So I used to like, you know, on these international breaks, if I didn't get a game, I would just close the dates and um, and just just relax or go away for a few days mm. because you, you have referees are like players; they do need to take time out and have that break. Yeah, there's no, there's no question that. You can, I mean, when you, when you actually look at Premier League players, the overseas players, and the distances that they're travelling, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I refereed in Mexico two or three times, Australia and New Zealand, and they were they were really you, you came back, Mark, no matter mm. how fit you mm. felt you were, you came back jaded mm. because of the uh, because of the amount of travel, Absolutely, and you know yeah. we've got to look at guys are getting up at four o'clock in the morning. They're at the airport for six. They're catching a very early flight, and then in in they go to whichever country that they're going to. Mm. It, it's great to be able to go to other countries. I mean, I used to go to the Eastern Bloc a lot, and um, and there you, you you almost saw the news that you listened to on BBC or any other channel. You what you were hearing, you you'd actually seen mm. in the previous days that you visited that country. Yeah. Oh, just a a, a final thought from. Both of you, uh, now, if I may, on what's to come this season. And and there seems to be so much more pressure. I don't know why it is this season that uh, perhaps because there's a changing of the refereeing and, and VAR still in the problem that it is and what have you. Do you, do you have a sense that um, that the referees now have just got to calm things down a little bit more than they are at the moment? Because I can see... Um, one or two wild things happening with players taking the law into their own hands, if you don't watch it. There's even creeping in a little bit today, that was now and again, with yeah. raising arms and this leg now being sort of thrust towards the chest of the other players and what have you. Yeah. yeah. This is down to leadership, Mark. And mm. I, yeah. in a way, I, you know, I thought Howard would, would deliver a greater change than he's at this moment. I don't know why. I think he's got the background to generally to be able to do that. But I think he's got to change his lieutenants because they're not good enough. I think they. I think these are the guys who are face-to-face on a daily basis with those referees. They themselves weren't great referees, Mark, and I think this is the shortfall. The shortfall is the quality of those that are coaching and those that are giving the true leadership as to how they want their group of referees to mm. officiate. And when you've got a referee that's out of form, performing, or not good enough, 
that's when you get paid the big bucks to make those decisions that say, I'm I'm dropping you down yeah. or, or I'm actually releasing yeah. you. And I think I, I think it's got to be recognized this is a business and there is a requirement to deliver the very best performances. We certainly are well off that. Yeah. You know, I think the FA Cup, to some degree, they relax because they're probably not face to face with the PGM well management. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. that's why probably we've got a more relaxed approach for the referees. Well, uh, we've got really about ten seconds. Well, um, I, well, I said it. I said it earlier, didn't it? It's about it's about managing the game, managing the players, <laughs> and we we just seem to be throwing cards around like this confetti. We've got to we've got to manage the players and talk to the players. Mark and Keith, as always, thank you very much indeed. We're looking at football finance next. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Republic of Mike Graham. Ah! Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an Eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. 
How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Your illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious! Well, we've got plenty to talk about in this uh, next hour with uh, Andrew Mills and Gavin McGaw. Delighted to say that we'll be looking at that Leicester City points deduction, one or two other things that could be happening. James Sharp will be joining us, sports reporter uh, for the Mail on Sunday, but a big Leicester City fan as well. And uh, Greg Double, Sell Before We Die campaign, and Dan Clark, the Heroes of HP12 podcast. That's Wickham buying Reading's training ground. All of that to come then in the next hour. And uh, Death of a Boxer is a book that's been written by Pete Carvel and uh, he joins me just after nine o'clock and it, it it's really is an important book. So looking forward to uh, talking with Pete about that. Andrew and Gavin, a very good evening to you. Hey, Mark. Um, look, I want to start with um, something that won't surprise any of us and hasn't surprised any of us, that the Premier League... Um, basically inactive when it comes to anything but stalling and finance for the EFL. And uh, here we go again, really. Andrew. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's depressing, Mark, that, that we talk about this week after week. And, and again, I think we spoke about it uh, months ago now. And I said to you, I wish I... I wish I held more confidence that this that 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 all of the stakeholders were genuinely engaged in trying to find uh, find a route to distribute the money. I mean, you know, we're we're looking at what seems like significant sums, and and the PR exercise is out and working. They talk about nine hundred million, which is which is barely fifteen percent of of kind of net income from TV deals, etc. But the reality of this is. The, the the pyramid doesn't work without it or certainly without help. Now, I would agree that's the pyramid's fault. However, we've got to the position we're in. Everybody understands where we are. And as I said to you before, when 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 Gavin was when Gavin was uh, was was working his magic for the league and I was working for a football club, my thoughts then were with every time we're asked or or, or we're, it's suggested we're being gifted something, there was always you know, something attached that would be really significant that from, from a club point of view and an EFL point of view, we were having to give up. And the truth is, absolutely nothing's changed. Mm. Well, no, it hasn't. And um, the Championship won't become a fairer league until pay uh, parachute payments are gone and things are sorted in a much better way. Good uh, evening, Mark. Gavin. Uh, hi, Mark. You, you guys both know me well, OK? Even yeah. when I was at the EFL, yeah. I had a problem with the concept of it being a handout world. And Andrew and I have talked lots about that. So I'm all in favor of money being handed down as part of solidarity payments. I'm all in favor of there being money coming from the Premier League. But I sometimes think we lose all reality when we're looking at the amounts in question here. 900 million is a significant amount on top of already different payments which go into charities and other things from the Premier League and on top of taxation and everything else. It's an additional taxation in effect. That's the way the clubs will look at it. Now, I know that's wrong, but we've got to put ourselves in the, um, in the owner's shoes within the Premier League. They're thinking an extra 150 million per year, whatever. That's madness. And look, I'm think money must be transferred over, but that's very similar to the amount of the whole EFL TV money over five years. Mm. So, you know, this is significant amount of money going to what the owners in the Premier League see as competitor clubs. You have to remember that. And the one thing I just say to you, I think it's got so high now that there may be a view on the ownership table of the Premier League that why not wait for a regulator to enforce it? Because when you actually do the mathematics, 
and you look at taxation already paid and all those things, it's a very dangerous game to play for the EFL to think they're going to get more than what's already on the table. And I know the Premier League clubs have not agreed that, and that's because of splits at the Premier League level, which are not good. But it would be a very dangerous game, I think, for both sides to go to a regulator. It doesn't mean more success for the EFL, per se. Well, I mean, who knows when we're going to have a independent regulator to sort everything else out on this. I, I, I did take a wry smile when Peter Risdale, the executive director of Preston North End, added, there's no offer. It's very frustrating for the whole of English football. Um, you know, there, there has to be pro-action on both sides here getting together. And as, as Gavin has said, Andrew, you know, a, a decent deal has to be sorted because otherwise this is just not going to happen. No, absolutely. And again, the, the, you know, there's there's lots of truth in what Gavin says. Um, however, you know, I I come on here and I've spent the last two days trying to think of, of you know, conversations we're going to go on to later about sporting sanctions and stuff, yeah. various routes to apply it, uh, to apply what may be a better structure. And it is really, really difficult to come up with a one size fits all. However, that is the responsibility they're tasked with. Um, yes, I understand that the sums are significant, but it was the Premier League that that condoned the method in the first place, or, the, or put in place a formula. And you know, I think it, I think it is their moral duty, and this is where the problem lies. It's their moral duty to have this conversation in a constructive manner, and where they look to actually find a solution. And I, and I think. Why I, why I point out it's their moral duty, because what Gavin is suggesting is that the moral duty doesn't have a lot to do with their duty of care for their business. And I, and I totally understand that and totally get it. And if I found myself, you know, if I found myself arguing from a Premier League standpoint, mm. I, think, I think I would be, I think I'd be limited in the traction that I could get where, as I said, where those businesses we know, you know, are struggling themselves to, to however much the revenue is, they're struggling to make it work. So there are so many, and, and, and the issues run so deep, that again, this, this isn't, you know, this is not necessarily their priority. We, we, when we look at the Premier League, and again, possibly something we'll talk about, but when we look at the Premier League, mm. they're all struggling to make the business model work for themselves. That's without considering giving away more money. Mm. Shouldn't have squads of 45 players then, should they? I Gavin. think that's, that's but then maybe they shouldn't have the games, yeah. Yeah, but 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 guys, let's just again take a step back. We're not talking about the Premier League not giving money; they're already doing that. We're talking about additional money on top, um, and that's the gamble here, really. Whether a regulator down the line is going to force them to do more. Personally, I think this will all be agreed by the June AGM meeting for the Premier League. I think it's inevitable that it will be. I think there'll be a lot of horse trading behind the scenes amongst Premier League clubs because the question is whether it comes from each club mark, whether you know every club pays exactly the same amount of money, which is going down in effect seventy five percent of that to Championship clubs who are trying to get up in their place. So this is the eye. It's not money way. for nothing, Gab. I, I know, no, I know that. I know that, Andrew. But just hear me off for a second. The question in the Premier League is whether the top teams pay more and the bottom teams pay less. That's the big argument. So that has to be worked through at a Premier League level as well. So there's there's arguments all over the place, not only between the EFL and the Premier League, but within the Premier League. And then this great argument about whether you actually just leave it, keep paying what you're paying now, and leave it and see whether you'll be forced to pay more or not. Now, it's a gamble. Everything's a gamble. Mm. Yeah, seeming, seemingly is, Andrew, isn't it? And I think that they will just leave it, though, the Premier League, won't they? And if it happens with a regulator down the road at some stage, so be it. But you know who knows nothing nothing seems to be uh done uh properly these days unless it's for the clubs themselves in the premier league doing their own thing i mean we know that they're a a disparate band together when they get inside that um room together they all agree and then they all walk outside and uh, sort of go back to their clubs and tell them they've totally disagreed with everything that's been said anyway so um i, I don't know where we go with all of this do you well the no, no, quite frankly. Um, but again, I, I, as much as Gavin is absolutely correct with everything he says, the reality is, and I was part of, a, of an EFL club at that point, you know, we gave away so much with EPPP that, you know, th th there is an undercurrent of, of, of the, the Football League had these 
you know, staple parts of their business that they were able to turn into cash. They were able to work the system, sell the players, have young players, all of those kind of things. And we gave that away for the money that was given or gifted to us at, at the bequest of the, or, or at the, the gift of the Premier League. And so, you know, this was always going to be the problem was we're, you, you're always negotiating from, from the point you find yourself in, not mm. the, the point that you started in, which actually the EFL had some strength in. And my argument with the EFL at that point was you're giving away things that we can never get back. So what you're doing is you're weakening, continually weakening your hand until you get to a point where Gavin is exactly right in that they haven't got anything. They, the only thing the EFL they can, can do is, is perhaps ask politer. That's it. Say please and thank you and, and hope that, you know, there is a, 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 a moral um, a moral code that the, that the Premier League a, apply. And again, thinking back, the Court of Public Opinion also did the same thing during COVID. So the Court of Public Opinion was scathing about the Premier League's um, help or assistance in mm. terms of bailing out the EFL. And again, I understand the complications of why should they? Well, why should they? Is because the danger of what happens if they don't. And if they don't, there is no pyramid. There is no EFL. So they have to, and we're reliant on them wanting to and that's the problem mm. we're relying on them wanting to when in essence who wants to give away more money than they have to no i understand all of that and uh gavin i mean you know when it came to the covid thing and players promised this in charity and that in this and teams this and that you you know if you follow the money half of it never ever went anywhere i mean this is this is the problem isn't it they are so clever at sort of saying things um getting everyone else excited and then just Never happens. Never happens. But, but Mark, I think we sometimes have expectations which don't fit with reality. Because during COVID, they did bail out the EFL, in effect, when they needed the cash. The EFL, nor the Premier League, have had to take money from venture capital firms or private equity, like most leagues around the world. That's not happened. We are in control of our own destiny. You know, I'm actually with Andrew in terms of EPP. Uh, I was on the side fighting against that as well from within the uh, EFL at the time, as Andrew will know. Um, but sadly, we lost that because club owners wanted cash. Mm. Uh, and in effect, what they're seeking to do with the new deal as well, Rick Parry wants to bundle the Premier League and the EFL international rights deals together uh, after their rights deal finishes. And I think that's sensible in that way. I don't think that's giving much away. I think there's a sizable um, upside from that. But to talk about getting 25% of another league's, in effect, um, uh, monies coming in from TV when it's bundled with your own, which is what they want ultimately, mm. it's a hell of a lot, Mark. And if you're an owner of a club, you just don't like that. And so I, I think we're, we'll talk later, I know, about Leicester and other things mm. and possibly Forest. There's a bit, you've got to give some to get some here. And I think this has been a battle from the start. I think the EFL created a lot of tension with Premier League owners unnecessarily at the start. And people forget about that. Because everyone's just saying, Premier League got money, give it to them. Life's not that simple. The Premier League are already giving money. I'm not saying it's enough, but they're doing it. And if you're going to get any more, you've got to work with them. Mm. What a, Just in this bit as well, what, what a, what's your take on um, the FA Cup, which has been great, but replay is uh, basically going to be phased out? Does, that doesn't help anybody in the EFL if they get a long way in the competition, does it? No, and I think, Mark, just very briefly on that, I think both that and the League Cup, all of that's in the mix for conversations here because there's a real danger that European football has just taken over, in a sense. Mm -hmm. There's too much football, as we know, but to lose FA Cup replays is dangerous for the smaller clubs. Um, League Cup, as well, is really, really dangerous if we lose that further down because it's such an important area to breed new talent, but also to bring revenue in which is much needed at league one league two and championship level mm. so i think these things are dangerous there must be upside though if you're going to change what you're changing with the fa cups there must be other financial income coming in i'm sure that's part of the deal i'm absolutely sure of that nothing gets given away for free trust me as andrew knows as well no exactly that andrew yeah, look, again, it's, you know, that's part of the frustration is, is as I said, you, you know, the Premier League needs needs this change of kind of, not of structure, but the, these changes more than the EFL need to give them. My argument going back 10 years was that 
the value of giving those things away is far more than we get back. And and again, I, I do, you know, I understand, I understand the sentiment of the amounts that the Premier League are looking at giving. But but if it if it had if it had been if there'd been a fairer outlook from the start, if if the EFL had understood, and and Gavin's exactly right. You know, I spoke to you before, Mark, about mm. about actually, I think I was in League One or League Two at the point, and we got a consensus of we're not going to do this. We are not going to stand. This is this is time to draw a line. We walked from the room to the main hall, and by the time we got there, everyone had disintegrated because of exactly the point Gavin's just mentioned. The truth was the owners of the business needed cash because they were being forced to put cash in themselves. Mm. It's a far bigger conversation. It is. It is all connected. The knee bone is very much connected to the to the ankle bone, and that's what we, that's what needs to happen. Is they need to there needs to be a period of you know serious consultation where clubs actually get together in terms of their league and find a solution. We're going to talk um, points deduction next, gentlemen. Uh, we will be joined by James Sharp uh, as well in the next uh, session. Leicester City points deduction adding to the others. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back. The party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Independent Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Well, a very good evening to you. Welcome to the show. We're talking uh, football finance at the moment. We're going to talk more about Leicester City now as uh, uh, it's uh, been uh, a hot topic, of course, uh, all of this week with uh, over the 22-23 uh, season and uh, the three-year rules, they are going to fall foul with an £83 million uh, loss. They prepared their latest set of accounts at the end of the month and uh, they could be in all sorts of problems. Look, before we even go into this in detail, Gavin and uh, Andrew, I'm delighted to say that we're also being joined now by uh, James Sharp as well, uh, sports reporter for the Mail on Sunday and a, and a Leicester fan. So, so General, just a, a point from all of you here really is this is going to go on and on, isn't it, with different clubs. Something has got to be sorted properly with all of this because We've talked a lot about finance in the championship and lower. It's all about, isn't it, being able to bring in kids and spend less by making sure that they make the money when they get transferred on. And yet um, it doesn't seem to be happening and, and there will be others. Um, and how many points they get when they get back into the Premier League or just be, well, it could be anything, Andrew. Well, look, what, what we're seeing is is effectively a reverse handicap system. Um, and again, I spent a lot of time thinking about this over the last week in terms of just because of Leicester's specific situation in, in you know, is there another way to find a sporting sanction? But what we're actually seeing, football appears to me to be the only sport that handicaps the weak against the strong, whereas everywhere else, you know, you got you, horse racing, the, the strongest horse carries more weight, Golf, the weakest player, gets more shots. So, what worries me is that there was an underlying feeling when I when I was in you know I was in a, a position at a football club that the Premier League and the Championship to some degree made every effort to to retain the status quo. And the the big complaint about the European Super Super League was no relegation, no promotion. Well, essentially, we're building a we're building a situation where. You know, if, if if Leicester were to come up with a point deduction, and I don't, as I said, I don't have an answer for how you could do something different, before they've even started, they're handicapped because they don't have the same revenue and the same turnover, so they can't go and spend without finding themselves in the situation that Nottingham Forest are currently in. And it gets harder and harder to compete and to stay in the division when what you're actually going to find is that, that most of the teams in the Premier League stay the same and three come up and three go down. Mm. Um and, it, and that's what worries me. Yeah, but well, I've got to come to you now, if I may, Gavin, and, and, and George's sort of first take on this before we uh, have a word, obviously, with James. I've been really shocked by this one, Mark, because Leicester City have been the fairy tale story of how to do things right. Um, and we all look at it as a hope that people can challenge the big six um, and spend money in the right way. They're wizards. When it came to transfers, you know, bringing players in cheaper, selling them on for more. Look at Conte, look at uh, Drinkwater, uh, Mares, look at Maguire. You know, we've seen it recently with Madison and others. You know, they have been very, very, very clever at doing that. But then you look at the numbers at 2021, 22, 2 season, mm. they lost 92 million quid. That's so scary. And it just goes to show back to Andrew's point, just to compete. If it doesn't work for a couple of seasons, get it wrong. You're having to throw money at it. And that's mm -hmm. the danger here. And the, the irony to what Andrew was saying is Leicester have been the fairy tale that shows it is possible to compete differently. Yeah. But now it's caught up with them. And it was caught up with them as well. But during um, James, good evening and welcome to the show as well. The, I mean, COVID had something to do with a little bit of this because they they were in, uh, you, you know, the, the downfall in in the transfers uh, during the COVID situation didn't help Leicester City at all, did it? No, it didn't. And hi, chaps, by the way. And yeah. yeah, this is the the thing about Leicester is that for so long, they were the example of how to do it and how to do it well. And for so long, they did do it well. The problem is they then stopped doing it well and did it quite badly and have proved that if you're a 
a team or a club of Leicester's size, you don't have to stand still for very long or get much wrong, and you soon get swallowed up. Mm. So Leicester had, as you pointed out, they used to sell a top player every season. Then they stopped doing that, mm. and they, they didn't get the money in for that. They crucially missed out on the Champions League two seasons in a row. No team spent longer in the top four over two seasons than Leicester did. Not Man City, not Liverpool, no one. And both those seasons, they missed out on the Champions League and all the money that that brings. So that then affected them. They then had some really poor transfers. They had a really bad transfer window where they spent £50 million on players who didn't really make much of an impact. And when you're a team like Leicester and not a team like Chelsea or Man City, if you get a couple of players wrong... You can't afford just to ride it off and go, oh, well, we'll just spend another £50 million pounds on some other players. Mm -hmm. That really then affects you. And then they handed out big contracts to players who didn't really deserve it. And as the performances on the pitch then suffered, all of this, when you're a team of Leicester's size, all of this can just eat you up really, really quickly. Mm. And as we've seen now all of those things have done and Leicester are now in a really, really pre precarious predicament. Um, where does it go, actually, James? Because um, at the end of this season, let's say that, you know, they go up. How many points do you think that they could be given as a punishment to start with? Which, you know, the rest of the, who are still in the Premier League will be rubbing their hands thinking that there's only going to be, you know, there's going to be one less side going down. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, the answer to that is who knows? Leicester haven't released their accounts for this coming, well, their most recent accounts yeah. yet. It should be coming out soon, and then we'll have a, have a clearer picture of that. I think Leicester will be will be looking at what happens with Forest as an example. We've seen kind of what's happening with Everton. So I think until we can really see what's going on with them, I think we are kind of in the, in the unknown here, especially because... Leicester are going to break, going to get charged for breaking rules, possibly when they're in the Premier League. But now they're a Championship club, and yeah. then they're going to break EFL rules, but then be a Premier League club. So we're in a very strange situation. Of, mm. it'd be interesting to see what the leagues do and how the leagues come together to possibly come to an agreement on how to punish Leicester, because it's not as clear cut as you break Premier League rules, therefore you get this punishment, because they've done it while getting relegated, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Yeah. It's, it's it's quite amazing as well, Gavin, though, isn't it, that we're, we're still talking about this with 115 different charges uh, facing Manchester City, and nobody's even bothering about that as that gets pushed down and down and down again. Yeah, look, that's complex, as we've talked about, and it's, yeah. all, um, it's a different charge for them. It's yeah. quite them. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, uh, but just for the fans who we all speak to a lot of the time, Gavin, they don't understand why they're going to oh. get away with it for so long. You're right, particularly when it's your club getting penalised. Um, mm. But I do think for Leicester, there is, and James, I would say this, if you look at what Forrest appeared to be doing in their um, conversations with the commission uh, adjudicating over them, I suspect they're doing a deal where they'll have their pen penalties reduced slightly <clears throat> if they don't um, uh, appeal against it uh, in some way. So a deal can help with this. Um, but whatever happens, Mark, um, whether they're still in the EFL, which I'm sure they won't be, or they're in the Premier League, there will be points deductions next year because the EFL and the Premier League can work together to make sure that happens. But how do we change all of this? Because, of course, the only ones that are really... Um... Uh, the ones that miss out most of all are the fans, Andrew. Yeah, and look, and and, and that I, I think you could take an opinion from from all four of us here, and I don't think we'd find a, a panacea for that. Um, and you know what what you're hoping for is that the football club, the individual business, uh, values its relationships with its supporters, and so then it never transgresses. Well, we know that doesn't happen. Um, you know, I've said before on here. When I was when I was at a club, and we were in the Premier League. You, you know, my battle was was to get the board at that point to understand that, you know, having the same budget year on year was actually going backwards. Standing still in the in financially is going backwards. So we're talking about clubs that are having to come up with a seismic challenge of how they can can even 
even on chance compete. And look how easy we talk about, you know, what model they have to adopt is selling their best players. Well, those best players are responsible for them staying in the division. Mm. If they sell them, they're responsible for allowing the business to continue to, to do business in the same division. Yet it becomes a, it becomes an issue that, that gets extrapolated until eventually you end up with the Boltons and the Portsmouths. And, you know, people go back to to the level that they can they can fund themselves by getting people through the gate. And there is something there's actually something romantic about that returning. However, I'm not going to find that romantic if I've seen it, and, and I have in my lifetime, just quite how far Leicester has come, just quite how how much effort Leicester as a business have made to get to the point where they were able to compete. But the truth is, again, the system's handicapped and so they can't. Mm. And so in the end, somebody makes a desperate decision or takes a desperate, you know, gamble or a desperate punt and and then it's a flick of a coin. Yeah, I mean, James, I, I don't know what, which way um, Leicester City are going to think about all of this. I mean, it, you know, we don't know how many points they will get. They will get something it obviously looks like, but it could be that it makes it a non-season for them if they go up. Yeah, because Leicester, what they're going to have to do is somehow try and get their finances in order. And the easiest way of doing that, or the, probably the quickest way of doing that, is selling your prize assets for money which is great in a way in terms of balancing the books but then if you're Enzo Maresca the manager and you're going into a your first season managing in the Premier League and suddenly you're having to sell Kin and Dewsbury Hall you're having to sell James Justin you're having to sell Harry Winks you're having to sell all of these players and also other clubs are also going to know that Leicester need to sell them so you aren't going to get your full market value for them because Leicester are just going to be this as happened a little bit when they went down and they had to sell James Madison at a cut price and Harvey Barnes at a cut price. Mm. Leicester are a team who then look vulnerable and bigger clubs, bigger vultures tend to prey on those vulnerable clubs. And suddenly you go into a season, not knowing how many points you're going to start with, not knowing what players you're going to have. And that makes things very, very difficult. And I think Leicester are going to have to sell big players and what shape the team is and club is at the start of next season is anyone's guess. One of the other things, Gavin, for me about all this is as unsatisfactory looking at Forrest and Everton is that um, certain games that they have played in and they've lost points... They've still got others to play. It's actually skewing the whole of the competitiveness of the league. You know, this is this hasn't been a fair league season because various things have happened at various times. Suddenly they've been given points back during the season. None of this can happen. At any, they can't be chopping and changing like this. Oh, you're absolutely right, Mark. It's an absolute shambles, isn't it? Yeah. And I was watching the... Leicester City game today and I was just reflecting and I'm a Fulham fan James so I'd be very happy if you'd beat Chelsea today <laughs> so, and things. Uh, but I was thinking just uh, from a football administration perspective you, know, you always get penalised when you've been cheating as it effectively is against the league rules on mm. losses um, from a league perspective but you never get you never catches up for cup matches does it Mark? No. Uh, so you get away with having your squad at an enhanced level because you have spent more than you should have spent and you don't have anyone suggesting that you're cheating in a cup but it is true but all of this is unsatisfactory i the hope is as we've discussed before in the show that we're starting to see a bite we're going to see clubs being a lot better at sticking to the rules going forward because the the penalization is catching up with them well uh the, the, I hope they are going to get better, Andrew. And uh, in the meantime, it would be nice that uh, one or two of these Manchester City uh, cases were sorted as well, because until anything happens to them, everybody is just going to cry foul. Well, it's a cloud hanging over the, the, the Premier League, that's for sure. Um, I, I, I think, again, as I said to you, you know, being honest about it, I spent the week genuinely... <laughs> thinking about how you could possibly apply some other sanction that wouldn't affect, you know, affect supporters, how you could apply some sanction that wouldn't actually, again, retain or, or invisibly retain the status quo, because I'm suspicious that, you know, that that is an underlying fact of it all. And it's really, really difficult. And, and thus far, I haven't been able to come up with one. However, 
you know, again, we have to find we have to find a way. What worries me is that yes, uh, profit and sustainability is is having an effect. Yes, we saw that in January. But again, that that is having an effect, but that effect is so minimal that actually it isn't affecting the the, the handicap system against mm. the teams that that are looking to get promoted, and promotion almost becomes the death nail of of their sensibility to to continuing the processes that allowed mm. them to get promoted in the first mm. place. So, in itself, you know the 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 structure of 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 the sanction system. Well, we've seen it with Forest. Forest, Forest, for me, the very little I, that I know on the inside, Forest for me was a complete gamble of let's get us let's get a squad strong enough to stay in the Premier League, and we will deal with this problem as and when it comes. Mm. And and even with Everton, Everton viewed that if they were honest and they and they helped out um, and and basically admitted to, to everything, hopefully the sanction will be small enough that it won't affect their Premier mm. League status. And let James just a final. Uh point from you on this what do the fans think uh it's interesting because uh, i was in the away end today at stamford bridge and there's a little bit of chatter about it on on the way to the ground but when when the game was going on when all the chants were happening when leicester coming back from two goals down that it wasn't affecting the atmosphere and the Mm. joy and the that kind of togetherness and bond that Leicester fans were experiencing in the game. So I think it's not detracted from that at all yet. I think for Leicester at the minute, they're trying to focus on not screwing up this promotion battle. I think that is the kind of thing that's taken up most of Leicester fans' mental capability at the minute. Mm. But it certainly will. I think once the season is done, once Leicester have secured promotion, I think then it very much will be a, a case of fans worrying about what's happening next. Yeah. But I also know from listening to from some of the fans on the way, and we, you've touched on it, Leicester fans will keep talking about Man City's 115 charges because they were talking about on the way. They were especially talking about Forest because Leicester fans hate Forest anyway, and they're still at, they've been at it as well. So Leicester fans even though I think they've known it's been coming because they've seen how the club's been run over the last few years, there is still a bit of a, a bitterness there that mm-hmm. there are others at it. And there are others who, sure. Man City, for example, yeah. aren't going to get punished before Leicester do. No, exactly that. Um, James, great to have you uh, with us and uh, your insight into this story, a fascinating one. Um, we're going to be talking uh, Wickham buying Reading's training ground next. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, a very good evening to you tonight. With a lot of finance uh, in this particular hour, we're going to be looking at the golf and uh, the Six Nations uh, in the final hour to come as well. And uh, a terrific book, Death of a Boxer, uh, by Pete Carville uh, at nine o'clock. But uh, right now, of course, and it was a real shock, Reading fans are, well, they've been in despair, of course, with Dai Yong, uh, their owner, and all the things he's not done. And now, of course, it looks as if he's going to be in hock to the uh, tax man, amongst many other things. There's all sorts of uh, other monies that uh, they could well need uh, with short-term funding. And um, the story was that Wickham Wanderers were in exclusive talks with the owners to actually buy what is a superb Category 1 training facility, over 122 acres with three full-size pitches, the same as uh, that at uh, Reading Stadium and uh, academy and uh, ladies football and everything it's just it's just unbelievable um, delighted to say though to uh, talk to us greg double sell before we die campaign and dan clark the heroes of hb12 podcast from wickham wanderers as well wickham of course of uh, good evening to you uh, both um greg uh, Thanks. and uh, dan through gritted teeth yesterday as cambridge united uh, at least made you lot cheer up a little bit uh, with your four nil win uh, yesterday. But uh, Dan, I'm going to start with you because, of course, your Marlow training ground has been flooded down by the river and, yes. the, you know, you've had all sorts of problems with with where you train. Um, a deal comes along, you've been let down before, um, and it, uh, it's obviously not gone through yet, but it, it is, does this look as if it's going to happen? It, it definitely does. Um, I think it, it's one of those where, obviously, this is a positive for our club in terms of the long-term future but obviously you know it, it does cause some level of concern for for reading fans i mean to put it into context from a wickham perspective our training ground is not fit for purpose whatsoever um we sold it to survive back in 2013 um and have rented it back since but um as you say it's flooded it's built on farmer's land 
um, and it freezes and floods. We've had no ends of trouble. We've had to cancel friendlies. Um, schedule's been ruined, which um, obviously causes problems for, for our season. Um, and, and at the moment, the size of it means that we can't increase the squad or the staff size. So it's it's been a long-term aspiration for our owners to seek new facilities. Um, and they've obviously looked at opportunities for a larger training ground elsewhere. Um, but land is a premium uh, where we are in the yeah. Chilterns. is It's hard. So um, it, it is a, an ongoing issue. But obviously our owners for from a longer term position want to be a sustainable championship club so it's important for us uh that we we actually find somewhere that is longer term um and obviously this, this opportunities come into the fore yeah i mean it's difficult as uh, we're all football fans here aren't we and uh, greg for you know all of the stuff that's been going on with reading and uh yeah now i mean i i don't know was it um the die uh who uh, young uh, and the campaign that you have, have all had against him was he did he go to Wickham did he realize they were looking or or do you know exactly how it all came about no we've been none the wiser but what we do know or what we've been told at least is it was conducted by the Reading CEO Dion Pang without the prior knowledge of almost everyone else at the club so it was mm. a complete secretive agreement it shackled it, it it scared off um some potential buyers who were interested in buying the club as a whole um and seems to be done without anyone's notice now i will say with dan on the thing in the name of football solidarity like no one holds it against wickham fans no. like of course if you got offered a ridiculously good training setting you'd have it it does highlight that football's ownership problem has reached a new depth where you're willing to be complicit in asset stripping going through and that's why i think wickham fans joined us on the protest we had at adams mm. park on friday night because mm. it certainly hasn't passed the taste test and it's a horrible horrible feeling now look you're not going to i'm not going to i'm not going to bad mouth wickham fans because i can't because i completely understand where they're coming from and they want a facility and they want to be built sustainably it's just like the Wickham owner himself has said that Dai Yong is one of the worst examples of an owner that you've ever seen. And that's a bit that I think doesn't pass the taste test in terms of how it's done and how it's been sidled. Now, in terms of how likely it is to happen, there's all sorts of complaints and blocks and things that we can apply to it. But the bottom line is as well, we're also a bit mindful that if this secures the future of the club, it's a bitter pill to swallow, but we yeah. would swallow it what we have no confidence on which is why it's been some irritating is that and and i'd love to hear what andrew would have to say about this again based on some of the stuff he said last time i was on the show is that i would be astonished if that money comes back to reading football club so what you're actually doing is assisting with an asset strip you're not assisting with the prolonging of a football club but i would love to be proven wrong mark and i'm sorry what we did to cambridge on saturday no no don't be sorry about that at all i mean that's that's the game but uh, i think that you know you make some really good points there the, the the other thing with this shows really though that um somebody's got to sort this reading football club out haven't they i'll come back to you if i may greg because um, what's going on at the moment? There is now going to be a big tax bill that he's that he's not yet paid. There are going to be other things and, and what have you. I mean, you, you could actually see, we could see, I mean, we've had other threats from as West Bromwich Albion got over that with new owners, but it could, it could suddenly try and sort of sell everything through, but, you know, yeah. not necessarily as a as a going concern as a football club anymore. I mean, that's a pretty decent area for um, building. Yeah, which is why and there's a great irony in that I think a lot of football fans, I think a lot of Reading fans would have been like, fair enough, he sold it to a property developer, but when it goes to another football club, it just arcs, doesn't it? Mm. Um, the bit, look, let me let me, let me me take you through what it's been as a week as a Reading fan this week. Yeah. On Monday, we are fundraising because news of a £1 million shortfall comes in. And so we are begging fans to like buy tickets, even if they can't come to the football game, to make sure that money comes in. On Thursday night, it breaks at about half past ten, this story about the training ground. Now, the accusations that Reading fans have been hysterical about this, but we're not being hysterical. This man has killed two football clubs before. Mm. The evidence and pattern behaviour is this isn't, oh, thank God, Dae Yong's doing the right thing and he's funding the club and, as I said, bitter pill to swallow, but we'll swallow it. No, it doesn't. It looks like, if it looks like asset stripping and it behaves like asset stripping, and the man has asset stripped and killed two clubs before, probably is asset stripping as i said would love to be proven wrong now 
the light at the end of the tunnel is remarkably there are still some potential buyers in for us and there's all sorts of rumors and whisperings and things that exclusivity on a deal to buy reading football club isn't a million miles away but again i believe it when i see it because there's a series of pat the pattern has emerged that whenever something awful happens a carrot gets dangled for the fan base in terms of good news for us to all hook on on and sometimes when you win four nil on the weekend fans are th- like you have the feel good feeling back and it comes back again and you're like and see our fans get distracted from the fact that actually we're still in big big doo-doo here and yeah. look the, the, there's there's the short term and the long term the short term is we need desperate new owners coming in the long term is and it was really well summed up in the conversations you were having before is the whole of football is set up like a casino and casinos attract gamblers and we've mm. got a particularly bad one yeah and that's not wickham's fault that's not why the football's fault but it is only the fans getting punished for it. And I can tell you for free that Dai Yong doesn't care because he's done it twice before. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, looking at MK Tonsman, you've got a good, you've got a great stadium as well. It, it hasn't been full, uh, Dan, obviously, uh, in the way it has in the, in the past the whole time. Um, but, you know, the your two clubs, you, you, you're reasonably close, obviously. But what do you think is going to happen? I mean, you said there, yes, we think this deal will go through. I mean, it, there are two reasons... Um, as Greg was uh, saying there, that um, without a, a, what is a magnificent training academy, um, that takes a lot of the price off Reading Football Club. It does. And, I mean, obviously we can't speculate on the full terms of the deal. No. Um, it may well be that the, the, the credible suitors that were deemed to be credible suitors before were put off by the fact that, you know, that you've got a £50 million pound training facility there debts of rumoured between 70 to 85 million. You're looking at 150 million pounds to buy a League One football club. Um, I mean, that 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 could put quite a few people off potentially. Um, and, and we, we don't know the full terms of the deal. So it could be that actually taking the training ground out of the situation has enabled Dai to leave the club, which completely sympathise with you there, Greg, is that this calls for a need for a, a, an independent regulator for the game because this cannot continue. It's happened with Berry, it's happened with Macclesfield, it's happened with nearly Bolton as well. And obviously, they sold their training ground to Wigan back in 2017, mm. I think it was. Yeah, they um, also sold this all, is going they, to... all the land around the ground as well for yeah. car parking for others and and what have you. I exactly, mean, it's desperate. This yeah, this is going to continue <laughs> to happen if if would... we do not change. Yeah, I would love to say it's completely unprecedented, but it's not quite. Like I think Black, I think Blackpool and Preston, or I forget mm. if it's Wigan or Blackburn, similar things have happened. But to that, look, as you can probably tell, Dan and I are coming from the same place as football fans. I completely get it, but there is something about even the way that this training ground could have been bought is going to be inherently a bit dodgy and a mm. bit backdoor, and something weird has happened in terms of just a sheer amount of money that's being talked about exchanged. Mm. That's not coming from a profit or sustainability point from Wickham's point of view. So there's clearly something not quite right adding up with all of this. But football's a wild west, and it's the wild west in Berkshire and Bucks now, which is one of the least wild west places you can possibly imagine. Yeah, I mean it. It, it, it really is. I don't know what 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 do Reading fans do next, though. I mean, you have done so much. No, no so uh, so. It's relentless pressure, right? So our view is, and it's why I'm so grateful to be on a show like this and all the other people who've, who've, who've let us on, is that this is a club and a regime, rather, that likes to operate in the shadows. So all we can continue doing is shining a light whenever they do something that smells wrong, looks dodgy, probably is dodgy. So we're grateful for all the media support, and we won't stop shamelessly putting the story out to the media because this is a club that operates in secret. It's secretive in the way it's done transfers, in the way it's like, mm. in the way that assets have been removed from the club and into certain management groups and all the rest of it. So all we can do is keep shining a light on it because they mm. like operating in the shadows. And the mm. more that we're spoken about, the more we talk, the less they can do it. And then hopefully we'll have a better game that we can all talk. I'd love to be talking about football one day with Dan and you well, rather than rubbish. Exactly. Well, we will do, I'm sure, at one stage. Dan, for, for you guys, though, any is there a time scale? have you heard on a deal or is it going to be suddenly announced and all done and completed without anybody knowing beforehand? I've not heard anything on terms of time scale and there's been nothing clarified. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of people are questioning where have Wickham found such a 
huge investment uh, or sum of money in such a short space of time but we have um our, our owning um, company Feliciana have recently onboarded a Georgian businessman called Mikhail Lomtadze, um, who operates in Kazakhstan and, and owns, I think it's Amazon, the Kazakhstan equivalent of Amazon. Um, and I, obviously, I think for us, um, because we're quite uncertain about his involvement with the club, um, this will bring it to the fore quite quickly, um, and we'll have an understand greater understanding of how how that will operate. Um, but obviously, you know at this level we operate different to it's not sure. the traditional financial fair play we're under scmp which means obviously the the players uh wages are regulated rather than everything else so in terms of the long going ongoing running costs and everything else we're not going to be regulated by our turnover on that so um it will be interesting to see our longer term yeah. future and the implications for that but obviously think things are changing our, our, our club yeah well dan thank you very much indeed greg as always it's a delight to talk to you and uh, we will continue to follow this story thank you for the news that matters for the opinions that matter for the stories that matter find me vanessa phelps every weekday at 4 p.m only on talk on tv on radio online and on your smart speaker Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, so <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Independent Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Look back at the Six Nations Championship with Nick Easter and George Shooter to come. Jeremy Dale with uh, uh, what is coming down the stretch now at the Players' Championship. All of that still to come in the last hour before Howard Hughes at 10 o'clock. But delighted to say that Pete Carville uh, is joining us right now. Pete has written Death of a Boxer. And I'm going to come on to the book in just a moment. And it's a, it's a very important book and a very important and good read. Uh, but Pete, first of all... I'd just like good evening to you. I'd, um, good evening, Mark. I just for having I'd, me on. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I just want you to tell us your history here because you've been an editor and all sorts of things and author and and what have you. But you love boxing as well as watching it. I do. <clears throat> Sorry. So yeah, I, I first wandered into a boxing gym around about the age of nineteen or twenty, and it changed my life. My this is my life before boxing and then my life since. Um, so I went to this gym at the age of 20. I was didn't really have much direction in life, didn't really know where I was going. And everything I managed to achieve in my life since then, I got through boxing. And I, I actually, I owe it everything in my life. At the same time, I look at it and I can see the damage it does after being in it for over 20 years. And so I end up with this sort of fairly mixed emotions towards it. On one hand, I love it and appreciate it for everything it did. And the other hand, I, I, I still hate it. Mm. I completely understand uh, all of that. I remember the first time I ever covered a professional uh, boxing fight ringside, I wasn't prepared for, A, the, the dullness of the sound that was uh, so different from watching everything on the television with commentary teams, and secondly, um, the disgusting spray, blood, everything else that you got sitting there as well, and, and how, how very different the whole thing was i mean it was exciting but it was the rawness was incredible yes it's it's primal uh, a, a boxing match um, live is primal when you're missing the commentary i remember years ago i went to watch joe calzaghi versus jeff lacy at a manchester arena which was in um, sort of aprilish 2006 and i was there at the fight and jeff lacy took a hell of a beating in the fight he was never the same again and i watched the fight later I through a DVD or something, and the sound was different. So where I was sat in the arena on the night, you could hear the punches landing on mm. Lacey's head from about eighty feet away, and every single one sounded like a, a like a baseball bat hitting a tree. And the sounds toned down on television. It's toned down when you watch it later, so it does lose that that primal sense mm. about it. Yeah. Um. Let's talk then uh, about this book, which uh, Mike Towell. Uh, is the boxer that dies just before midnight, the day after he's injured in the ring. You tell the whole story, obviously, the lead-up. There's there's nothing particularly special about him, but he does have a chance in this particular fight to actually then fight for a title and get a bit mm. more money on on TV and, and what have you. But it is interwoven with so many other stories to do with not just the great side of what you reward you can have but what boxing leaves um, the individuals both men and women like when they uh, are really nearly too old to be carrying on and how much mm. punishment that they have received yeah so the book started originally uh, Mike Tal died in 2016 and around 2018 and 2019 I was looking for a book project to write and I had read about Mike Tell, and the uh, report from the Fatal Accident Inquiry in Scotland was available online. So I, I went and read it, and I thought, well, this is a, a fascinating story. And I, I compared it at the time when I was doing my original pictures to John Krakauer's Into the Wild, which I'm sure many of your readers will be familiar with. And I saw it as a story of a young man trying to find himself in something bigger than he was, and unfortunately paying the, the unfortunate tragic. Uh, consequences of that so that's where the book started now when I went to the publishers and I spoke to them about the book itself they said it, it's a 
good story, but it needed to be a little bit longer and it needed to go a little bit deeper. And I'd been in boxing for you know nearly 20 years at this point, and I was telling them while I was having these chats about all these stories I have from being in the in the various gyms, and they said, well, why don't you just put those stories in there? Mm-hmm. And then while you're at it, go find something else to put into the book. And um, it took over my life for about a year, but it was a great year. I, I traveled mm-hmm. to Poland, I was in Sweden, uh, Spain, I went to the US, I was in the UK about uh, six or seven times, and I found all these boxing people that were just willing to sit and talk. Mm-hmm. And as I write in the book, it's, that it's not that they wanted to talk, but that they wanted someone to listen yeah. to them. And and that's where all these stories come from. And, you know, I'd like to just uh, give a shout out now to uh, Eric Scogland, my good friend in Sweden, who's in the book, and Zoe Hunter-Smith, who's also in the book, cause, and Alan in Pennsylvania, I hope he's listening as well, mm-hmm. among others, because these guys gave me their time and their stories, and I didn't deserve them. And I really hope that the book is good enough that they don't regret taking that risk with me. Yeah, look, I, I, I think it is, because I, I like the way that you sort of, you weave in and out, as I've, I've mentioned, and suddenly something different hits you. Take Jerry Quarry, you know, we, we, mm. we, we obviously talk, you know, you have the, the, the brain side of things and, and all the CTE and it's explained so brilliantly as well. But, you know, Jerry Quarry, that we find out from you, he, he actually, well, he died at 53, I remember him. Yeah. I mean, he fought all the greats, didn't he? Mm, he did. Uh, for, uh, Frazier twice, Ali twice, Patterson. Ernie Shavers, he fought Ron Lyle, like everybody. And the problem with Quarry is that he, there's a, there's a theory about Quarry that if he'd been born 10 years earlier, he would have been the heavyweight champion in the world. He just had the unfortunate um, look to come along in an era you had Ali, Frazier, Norton, Foreman, Shavers, and um, Foreman, George Foreman, strangely enough, said that the one fight that he avoided in his career in the early days was Jerry Quarry, mm. because they'd done some sparring in Houston and uh, Quarry was training and forms like I don't want any part of that guy but Jerry um as I said like he could have been the heavyweight champion in a different era but the problem is that once his era had passed he didn't know when to stop or he would stop and then he would come back and then he'd stop mm-hmm. again and then he would come back and he last fought I think in about 1995 in Colorado mm-hmm. when he was 47 years old and if I've seen the video of the fight and it's horrendous yeah. it's it's ugly to watch, and it's the same as brothers as well. Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, yeah. Mike Quarry, yeah. great boxer, couldn't couldn't break an egg with a punch, but a beautiful, beautiful boxer. And Mike had, I think, seventy fights and ended up in the same position as Jerry. And you know, all the way through this, you 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 have this great sense. Uh, I'm going to come all the way back to Run Corn now. Sure. Uh, to the other side of things, how that there is still an inherent pure sport within these boxing gyms from mm. people who just want to look after those that want to come along and perhaps turn their life around. Yeah, I, uh, Runcorn is my hometown. I'm from Runcorn, right? And Runcorn ABC, I trained up for a couple. I didn't start there, but I trained there a couple of years afterwards. And the work that these guys do is extraordinary. But it's always tempered, and Daz says this in the book, is that you're watching these small kids fight and get punched in the head and you think, is it any? Is it better than the alternative? And the alternative could be that they're carrying knives on the street. Mm. So it it becomes a case of there's no good answer. And I think that's one of the themes of the book is that you have to look at things in the u- ugly, complicated beauty and say there's no good answer. So you have mm. to come up with the best answer that you can. Um, but you go to this club and Runcorn's a great example of this. And they're showing the boys not just how to fight. No. They're not just showing them how to control their aggression. They're showing them how to be gentlemen in the ring and how to be respectful towards people and how not to be a loudmouth and how to know that, you know, if you go out in the streets and you get drunk and mess around and the police get called, it's not just you that looks bad. The club looks bad as well. So you're giving people a sense of belonging, that they are part of something bigger than themselves. It's a beautiful thing that they do. And again, at the same time, you have to balance it with the fact that, yeah, boxing is a brutal a brutal sport i was in the gym in Runcorn watching the guys train and i was watching these kids get punched mm. and i was wincing every time the punches landed now 10 years ago that probably wouldn't have bothered me so much mm. now that i'm a little bit older i look at it oh that's yeah. you know that, that that's painful and also in Runcorn as well i go to an mma gym and my good friend dean um runs the gym and uh, dean and i actually have known each other for 30 years so dean was at school with me when i was 10 
and I was in the same class as his brother, and we used to play in the street together, and I mm-hmm. hadn't seen him for 30 years, and then we became friends again with the book. And if you speak to Dean, and Dean's uh, had a, you know, he had a rough start in his early life, his early 20s, mm-hmm. and he's turned it all around, and he's become an actor. And I don't know if anyone here works in the film TV industry, but please check out Dean's reels on YouTube because he's a great actor. I'd really like Dean to get something out of okay. this as well. That's brilliant. And he's a f- cracking fella. One of the other things that you do, so I mean, you're, you're, you're brilliantly writing these short sentences, and we go from sort of hope and nearly glory at times to the sudden shudder again and how gloves and helmets both worsen brain damage. I mean, yeah. all, you keep you keep hitting us actually with things that um, makes you sort of go, and then you get to patient zero and Pender, and Pender, yeah, yeah. you know the middleweight champion of the world, and um, what happened to him, and and um, with CTE as well, of course, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, my best friend from football, um, who actually introduced me to my wife, uh, died of CTE, and your brilliant but terrifying description of the different phases of it and uh, mm. how, it, how it starts and how it ends, basically, and the, the brain just has the, the protein that locks into it and kills it, kills it off. Yeah, it's horrendous. Um, it, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And I, I went to Boston in the US and I spoke with their top people, they're the guys that run the brain bank and people who are affiliated <clears> with it, and they laid out or a lot of the science for me. And then I went on from Boston, I went down to Pennsylvania and I met with a guy called Alan Blyweiss, who's also become a good friend in the time since I've met him. And Alan was, he had two professional fights and then he lost them both and he became a professional sparring partner for Lennox Lewis. And he, he worked with Lennox Lewis, he worked with Tommy Morrison, he worked with, I think, Riddick Bowe. Uh, Alan's story is that whenever they were getting, whenever somebody was getting ready to fight Evander Holyfield, they would hire him because he was very similar in size and, mm-hmm. and height and style to Evander Holyfield. So he spent 20 years in the gyms doing 10 rounds a day with Lennox Lewis, and he's seen the effects of CTE now. And as Alan said to me, he knows it's going to kill him. Like He knows that's how his story is going to end. But he's trying, even in his, and it sounds, last day sounds melodramatic, but even mm-hmm. at this stage, he's still trying to give back. So he's working in the gym now in Pennsylvania, and he's shown the young kids how to be respectful and how to control themselves. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a brutal sport. I mean, I watched uh, Jermaine Taylor's in the book as well. When I was mm-hmm. getting into boxing twenty years ago, Jermaine Taylor was the guy, right? He was mm-hmm. the guy coming up. He was just about he'd just beaten Bernard Hopkins. He was about to beat Bernard Hopkins the second time. You thought that everything was on the table for him. Mm-hmm. Like you know, uh, he could have been commentating. He could have been nicely retired. He was a good looking kid. He had a nice smile. He he was going to be the next Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah. And then if you see his story after boxing, like it's just tragic. There's no yeah. way you can look at something it's tragic. And boxing did that to him. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember, I mean, I covered the 10 fights for a million with uh, Barry Hearn and the son and Chris Eubank Sr. Mm. And um, I got to know Chris really well and Ronnie is a uh, trainer. And uh, after every fight, we went, he went all over the place to fight and uh, as we all know, as you, as you describe as well in the book that, you know, he had, he had a brilliant chin but mm. my word, how many times he was hit. And I used to, after the press conferences and everything was over, he used to invite me up to his uh, suite and his bed, and we used to sit on the end of his bed and he would be, he would be spitting blood and he would be saying, I can't keep doing it, I'm keep getting hit and everything. And you just, you just admire these people at the same time as fear for them, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I, I got very close to a lot of fighters when I was doing this, uh, are people still active, so the one, I'm thinking most of in this sense is Anthony Yigit, who's um, from Sweden, and Anthony's still he's still fighting now. Like I, he's such a nice guy. I don't want him to fight anymore. <laughs> and then I went to Sweden as well. I met with Eric Scogland, <laughs> who's um, I've been a, I have a lot to thank Eric for for this book. And Eric wants to fight again. And I, Eric is such a nice guy. You have to work really hard not to like Eric Scogland. And I really genuinely wish he wouldn't fight again. Mm. Not just just because he's such a nice guy but yeah like the damage you, you see fights and you see a guy will win on a saturday night and then on sunday you get up with the kids and you go out and do something like you don't see these guys the next day when they're urinating blood when they can't talk because the jaws are so swollen when they maybe they can't see so well um yeah like the damage is for us it ends on saturday night 
when the TV credits roll. But these guys, the damage goes on for weeks, and unfortunately, it comes back years later. And of course, they they hide it well, don't they? In between yeah. fights. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's box gyms are very sort of secretive by by the way they operate. So the, uh, many years ago, there was an American heavyweight. I can't remember his name now. And he was given a, a medical ban uh, in Nevada, and yet he was still going around the gyms in Nevada as a sparring partner for the heavyweight contenders. So he, even though he's not supposed to be in the ring, he's still getting beaten up every single day. And these guys are, you know, they're, they're tough guys, but at the end of the day, they're still human <clears throat> beings. They absolutely are. Um, Pete, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It, it, it really is a terrific book. Uh, thank it's you, a thank book you for that, having me. There was really needed to. Um, be written um, it, as it says it's a cautionary tale but more importantly than that I think it's it's reality and why boxing won't ever go underground thank you how are you going to stop the votes this is an international problem how's that going for your party I'm a millennial you're a Victorian I think this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs>
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> Well, a very good evening to you. We've got uh, golf to come with Jeremy Dale. Uh, Scheffler leads from Harmon and Scheffler uh, at the moment as they come down the stretch at the players. Uh, 19th finish for uh, Rory McIlroy. It's not been his day. And Matt Fitzpatrick, uh, who was uh, challenging the lead at one stage, has also just dropped away a little bit. More on that with Jeremy in a while. Nick Easter and George Shooter are with us, though, now. And it's been a delight to have them with us during this Six Nations tournament, which Ireland uh, completed. Uh, from France and England, Scotland, Italy and Wales and uh, Wales of course uh, at the bottom and in, in really grim for them. We'll talk uh, a little more about that later but let's start if we may with with England even though France beat them by two points. Uh, an extraordinary game. Uh, France had been involved in two extraordinary games at the start and finish of this Six Nations. They won this one uh, as you know by 33 points to 31. But Nick and uh, George this was England showing the different style till the end of this particular tournament, and what a turnaround for them. Yeah, definitely. Um, carried on how they left off against Ireland last week. You know, we spoke last week, didn't we? And, and England have had these sort of false dawns, if you like, certainly in terms of, you know, uh, in layman's entertainment value, obviously we understand that there's a method to madness in terms of how you use the ball in the game of rugby. But, uh, you know, just challenging styles with the ability we got ball in hand and i suppose the one criticism we had after the island game was our lack of red zone conversion i.e when you get in the opposition 22 converting that to points and boy did they improve that this weekend because you know france must have had the territory and possession lion's share of it and mm. um england when they got into 22 were lethal were absolutely clinical and you know Coulda, shoulda, woulda, um, sadly didn't uh, win the game. But, uh, you know, to score that try, what, with four or five minutes to go, George Ford, who I thought had an absolutely fantastic game, repaid the face Steve Borthwick showed him. Mm. Um, things, You know, England will be very, very pleased um, with the Six Nations. Very, very pleased. It's gone well. Yeah, it has gone well, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, from where we were... After the Scotland game, or or, or yeah, before that, before the tournament, when people were a bit sort of hesitant about England, how England were going to play and how good Ireland and, and France were going to be, and um, yeah, it was just a, a battle between those two. To where we are now, where, where England um, have have well, obviously beaten Ireland and made a very very good uh, account of themselves against against the French. Um, yeah, there's lot, lots of signs for for. Um, uh, optimism, as Nick says, I think you, there, there have been a lot of false dawns, not just in this generation, but with England traditionally, we, we, we're, we're a team that uh, can sort of rise up to the odd occasion here and there, and then you think, oh, this is it, and then suddenly they're back to back to type again. So to put two games together against the two best teams in the tournament, uh, uh, two games of that quality is is a real bonus, bringing a real real positive signs and gives them a, a, a good a, a good sort of springboard to go into the summer. Uh, a uh, fairly uh, fairly tough uh, tour to New Zealand, and then uh, a pretty mm. a pretty sort of a uh, hectic autumn as well with all the uh, all the Southern Hemisphere teams. So um, I think yeah, from from uh, from where we were uh, at the end of January to now, uh, a really drastic improvement in England, and uh, hopefully yeah. sort of sets the tone for how they want to play going forward. And gone is the is the aimless kicking and hopeful chasing, and now actually playing with a bit more purpose. Just looking at Nick at one or two of the. The, the star men as well. Ben Earl's had a great tournament, hasn't he? He's been uh, the player of the tournament. Um, you know, in my eyes and a lot of other eyes, I've, you know, you look to when England, you know, probably weren't that pleasing to watch prior to Ireland, and he was a standout player. You remember his try against Wales that got us into it after Wales scored early, and he's just gone from strength to strength. Um, arguably, again, probably our best player in the World Cup, and. You know, I'm just pleased that England is showing faith in you know the talented athlete that he is, and you know, I suppose beforehand when Eddie Jones was in charge, or you know maybe this time last year, oh, is he a seven? Is he is he an eight? 
Well, he's proven to be our our RD surveyor, you know, the number eight for New Zealand, who was a seven at the beginning of his career, and they realised such an explosive guy with the ability to beat defenders and stay on his feet and cause absolute havoc with ball in hand and still apply his defensive sort of jackling turnover threat abilities. Why not stick him in, you know, the best position on the field, Saggers, mm-hmm. you know, number yeah. eight? Yeah, no, ex- exactly that, George. Who else has really caught your eye as well? Uh, a, a little bit of a bias for me, but I think the two Leicester lads, we spoke about George Martin last week, um, perhaps not as big an impact this week, but it, it's really good to see that we're we're producing some really uh, good grafting players like Chesterman and, and Martin. I think you need those sort of, uh, with all, you know, no disrespect at all, you need that sort of donkey work that Chesterman brings and you need that sort of... Um, the big hitting and, and potentially sort of uh, line breaking uh, physicality that uh, Martin brings, and seeing them play consistently well, like I say, back to back games. Uh, I think Chesham is fantastic. He's very under the radar. He's one of those guys that just does all the hard work, carries around the breakdown, makes a lot of tackles. He's is a nuisance in the malls. You never hear his name. You never you never see him on highlight shows or anything like that. But I think he's a sort of player that if you're in the in the pack with him, you know mm. he's there, and, and you actually you, you you're desperate to have him in the team with you. So. It's it's yeah you know, we're long overdue one of those sort of players in England colours, um, and you can't get enough of them in my eyes. And that, I think you know there, there's there, there were some. I think I think the pack was possibly second best at, uh, on yesterday. If we're being quite harsh, the scrum was not great. The mall, uh, the French side, you got the uh, up, got the sort of uh, edge on us in the mall. But it's good to see that there's just some some real fight. And we spoke about Ben L there. Uh, uh, just one of those horrible sports ironies that he gave away the penalty that ended up losing the game. He didn't deserve that at all. He was, I mean, it was a penalty, but he was, he's been fantastic. So great to have someone of his ability come to the fore and, and, and play very well. And like I say, great to have some some real dog and real fight from from a couple of mm. back five forwards as well. Just have a, a, a little chat, if we may, uh, Nick and George. Nick, I'll come to you first here. With uh, Ireland you know, champions. Uh, deserved champions, kicking themselves at what didn't quite happen for them at the World Cup. But, um, you know, they got across the line and they needed to. Yeah, they did. A um, bit of a nervy performance and Scotland, fair play to them, showed, you know, plenty of, you know, force of will, if you like, resilience, you know, defensive bravery. I mean, it must have held them up over the line and in, in by all accounts, the Andrew Porter try, you know, I'm still not convinced that was a try. You know, one, it, one, it was NFL style blocking to try and create the the running for him. And the second thing is, we're not sure if he grounded it um, over the line. But anyway, uh, you know, history will tell us that it was 17-13 to Ireland. And yeah, fully deserved. You know, they, they are the strongest team, the Six Nations. And for them not to play great last week and lose by one point to England away from home, you know, shows how good a side they are. And Look, it's never easy winning Grand Slams and Six Nations, you know, as they showed yesterday, but they had enough there to make sure that, uh, you know, they did the job and fully deserved. And, you know, everyone's, all eyes are going to be on their, you know, the summer tour when mm-hmm. they go down to South Africa. You know, South Africa are world champions, Ireland, you know, they're the European champions, if you like. And, you know, some are saying, are they the number one side in the world or are South Africa? Well, you know, bragging rights will will be decided after the two tests there in in June, July. Yeah, I mean, of the of the other, Italy have had a good tournament as well, haven't they? Yeah, crack it. I mean, um, the first time they've ever won two games, they probably could have won four games if uh, yeah. if if uh, a ball had stayed in the tee and uh, and England had uh, not sort of bailed themselves out at the end of the, that match in Rome in the early stages. So, uh, great signs from Italy and. I mean, uh, they, they, again, they were talking about false da- dawns earlier. They've had a few of them in the past, but I, lo- I like the look of this team now. There's a bit more uh, all-round game to it, all-court game to it. They, they used to re- rely on a scrum and a maul uh, and a couple of sort of nuggety back rows or you know, perhaps slightly better than nuggety. But uh, mm. now they seem to have added a, a real passion for defence. Uh, some fantastic attacking moves from the backs. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of that credit goes to Kieran Crowley, who was the previous coach. Uh, all he, he had all his critics, but I think he got them very, very fit. They look a very fit team, certainly a lot fitter than Italian teams of the past. And then mm. when you are a fit team, you can make those sort of decisions under pressure when you when you haven't got as much fatigue as perhaps a, an unfit team has. So Quesada's now come in and, and taken them on to a little bit more of the next level in terms of certainly those uh, first phase attacking plays. Um, and they've they've worked out how to win, uh, how to beat uh, teams that traditionally they, they, some of those games, 
to those two games they probably lost uh, probably one rather uh, they might have lost a few years ago they didn't have that now at the end of end of the play sort of last five ten minutes so uh, that's mm. great there's been lots of criticism about them should they be in the Six Nations should we let uh, Georgia or mm. Portugal or someone else in uh, I think the Italians have, have answered that question fairly resoundingly they have Nick uh, the first question that uh, Gatland asked after they got beat of course was that uh, he'd resign he's not that wasn't accepted, of course. He, he, but he's got some work, hasn't he, to do over the next four years? Yeah, he has. And look, he's he's probably the best guy to be able to do it. He understands Welsh rugby. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be that easy, though. Um, you know, the regions are cutting their budgets next season. Um, you know, their, their talent pool's looking quite thin, you know, despite some of the current players saying that, they, you know, like George North saying there's a lot of talent there. Well, you know, you compare it to, you know, France, England and, and Ireland and it's very, very thin and it, it doesn't really help, actually. You know, I think, you know, they, they're going to try and, you know, people like Faye Wabosa, you know, that we, we had on the wing. Um, you know, Gatlin decided to turn him down and, you know, we poached him and he's been a revelation for us. You know, guys like that who are schooled in England and then picked up, you know, by English academies and sort of offered the opportunity to play, in, you know, English premiership clubs with, you know, more money, more finances, more chances of, you know, winning the big trophies and everything. Those are big carrots that Welsh rugby and the regions are going to find hard to, you know, draw that talent back to Wales as, as qualified as they might be. It's it's going to be tough for them. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, this was a really good Six Nations tournament, though, wasn't it, George? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, funny enough, I think Ireland peaked on the first day. Yeah, that game against the French was... I mean, we spoke about the French having a hangover from the World Cup, and actually, mm. after that game, the Irish haven't really played that well. They've they've, they've mm. won games that, uh, like like yesterday that they sort of looked a little bit nervous and, as, as Nick said, looked, almost looked a bit tired as well. Um, but they get, the, the tournament started with a bang. As I said, there's the, the Italy the Italy factor that uh, kept everyone interested and the fact that the wooden spoon went down to the last game as well, which is not normally the case. Normally it's uh, Italy. In fact, they've won it, I think, nine times in a row. Uh, the Welsh haven't won the wooden spoon in nearly 20 years, I think, in 2003. Mm. Over, yeah, it's sort of... Yeah, so there's there's been lots to talk about. Some fantastic games. Uh, you know, the two England games last week and this week were, were genuinely fantastic Test matches as well. Great to win one and desperately disappointed to lose the second one. But genuinely, really very competitive Test matches. Real uh, effort on show. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't really talked much about red cards and yellow cards. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of. If you're a Scotsman, there's been a few uh, refereeing <laughs> decisions that you might want to have a look at and go over again. We just spoke about one and there was obviously the, the French game as well. But yeah, I think overall it's been been a very mm -hmm. good tournament. Um, yeah, the French have moved around their country a bit because of the Paris being getting ready for the World Cup. So there's been some test rugby in Lyon and, and Marseille, which are two fantastic rugby mm -hmm. cities. So yeah, all in all, I think it's uh, it's been a very, very uh, absorbing Six Nations and, and at times some, some very, very high quality rugby. Yeah, and Nick as well. You know, we we have to talk about this too. With uh, did, did the officials first of all, with um, the thoughts in mind of the of keeping the the players safe, particularly with concussions and and everything like that. I think there was that was that much better. Do you think handled this time? Um, a little bit better, to be honest, Saggers. But I still think we've got right. a long way to go to understand and. I know you're you're referring to head injuries and concussions, but yeah. you know you you look at the two calls that have gone against Scotland. You look at yesterday's call against England. Now I'm in agreement with George; it's a penalty, and I actually get quite annoyed that a lot of these tackles that are out around the shins don't get called up. Um, Ellis Genge got actually done for one, I think, in the first half, and that was about it. It's it's just. Where's the consistency applied? And the TMOs called that in. The referees obviously thought it was fine. And yeah, look, I think I think they've got a long way to go. I mean, how much involvement should the TMO have? Do we leave it a little bit more down to the referee um, and what he's seeing there in the moment? Because we know what sort of sport it is, and it's you know it's a collision game, mm -hmm. and we have to celebrate that as well. And Courtney Laws, you know, came out and said what a lot of players and and ex players and and supporters um, say quite often, but. He's got quite a powerful voice, and I think we now need to start celebrating the fact that look, this game isn't for everyone, no. right? It is a special type of person, a, a special type of mindset that you need to be out there, you know, getting your, putting your head in the spokes, and you know you're in a war every single weekend. But you know we enjoy watching it. Myself and George enjoy playing it that way, and 
You know, I think we've just got to embrace the positivity around the game. But this Six Nations, to answer your question, there was a lot less coverage about the negativity, yeah. for sure. Which I think was important. Um, could they speed up a little more when they when they go for all the... the, the um, to bring in the cameras and, and everything else with some of these technical decisions they've got to make? Or do you not mind that at all, George? I, I, think, I, think, I think they can. And again, I keep harking back to... Uh, Australian Rugby League, the NRL, you know, they, they seem to do everything on the fly. So there's very few stoppages in the game for those sort of things. They they have a slightly different um, procedure. Obviously, they have a report, so you can put people on report and they get banned on Tuesday night or whatever it is whenever they do their disciplinary. So, but I, I do think, as Nick says, there's work to be done. There's more work to be done, and it just needs to be streamlined. I think we want the game to be safe of course you do and i think we're sort of getting the right position now where the the the, the balance between getting the head injury stuff with the, with the gum shields i think we, we're we're sort of getting that data uh delivered properly we're not stopping the game necessarily to have a look at endless videos but but certainly some of the uh some of the decisions and some of the the two scottish ones there for example mm. uh yeah it, ju it just needs to be streamlined a bit i don't know exactly how you do it it's very difficult to sit here and and sort of uh, talk yeah. about it like that but it, it clearly is an issue in the game and less of an issue in this tournament as we said but it's still you know we're still talking about it and, and it's still a big subject that's that's marring the game at the moment so mm. it just needs to be streamlined i think and there, there must be there must be better ways of doing it if you ask me and I say other sports seem to have uh, a better grasp on it super league is similar as well it's it seems to be a bit more fluid we're, we're just uh, a little bit stuck in the mud with it for whatever reason yeah brilliant uh, both of you thank you so much for your experience and knowledge and it's uh, been great to have you through the six nations nick easter and george shooter with their expertise on what was a terrific tournament um it's uh, the players championship uh, they're going down the final nine and uh, it's tight and we'll talk to jeremy dale next Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, the players is uh, coming to a dramatic end. Scotty Scheffler, the world number one, has finished. He's uh, in the clubhouse on 20 under par. He leads by one at the moment. A final round of eight under par today. Jeremy Dale, uh, PGA coach, is uh, with us. Jeremy, good evening to you. Hi, Jeremy. Is he there at the oh. moment? Oh, there yeah. you are. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah. How are you? I'm very well. I'm good, well. good. I mean, we have just, radio contact. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, I've got the monitor on here and just watch Sheffley, um, who's uh, got every chance uh, with uh, two to plays on the 17th, and he's uh, he's found the green and he's not not too far away. This could easily go to a playoff, couldn't it? This one. Well, it could. It's an amazing performance from Scotty Sheffler. I had a big injury with his net yesterday. Yeah. Uh, where the injured golfer and up he pops and flips a a wedge into the hole uh, on the fourth hole and that sets him off and he finishes with a 63 and uh, and here we are. It's actually superbly exciting. Um, the problem with being one behind is that you've got to play the 18th, yeah. um, which is uh, the hardest hole on the course along with the, the 15th. And one of the amazing things about this course is, is, is that dramatic finish. So you can get big swings uh, either way. I, I wouldn't rule it out. And, and once these guys have to, make a birdie, you, you, you see them really go for it. And yeah. uh, and sometimes you see the most incredible thing. Will Wyndham Clark's just hit one to about six feet on the 17th. He's two behind. He knocks that in and then birdie down the last and it's a playoff. But uh, I'd like to be Scheffler. In the club pass. yeah. <laughs> if I was going to be any of them. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come and talk that that as it's going on. Um, Rory McIlroy in the end didn't happen for him at the weekend, did it? Quite. No, um, as with many, I mean, Matt Fitzpatrick was the same. I don't think anybody made more birdies, um, but both of them were, um, yeah, just too inconsistent. I think I think this has been going on a long time with Rory. Yeah. Uh, like he said on uh, on Full Swing, the great Netflix uh, series, you know, it's been so long since he won a major championship, which this obviously isn't, but he's been past champion, uh, that it feel, feels almost like he's trying to win his first one again, mm. and. Um, I think there's there's things that he does. He's he's slightly into out on his swing that gives him great drives, uh, but it, it it makes him suffer with his approach play. The wedge game is is definitely harder um, when you're playing with a with a draw. Most mm. of the guys play with a fade off the tee, which which actually gives more control with a short iron. I won't go into the technicalities. It's not really a uh, not really the time of the place for that. Um, I also find his his putting stroke slightly odd. Um, in, in, in he does something that I, that I don't see hardly any players do, uh, and that is he turns his shoulders quite a lot on the follow through, certainly on long putts. Mm -hmm. I can't help that that uh, thing that that doesn't help the line of the putts as well. So there are a couple of technical things with with Rory, and everybody's saying, "Oh, why don't you pull yourself together?" But actually, um, you see him working on his backswing and trying to get it more upright. Uh, that would give more of a fade, less of a draw, and I think that's really where he's got to go. I remember when he won the TPC, when this mm -hmm. very tournament. He aimed everything left and was clearly trying to play more of a fading uh, a fading game. And, um, yeah, that worked really well for him. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to criticise. He's such a great player, isn't he? No, no, he, he is. I mean, he's still in the top 20 uh, of this tournament. And, and Matt Fitzpatrick, who played himself in the form, he's not 
He's had a slow start this season, but uh, he'll be delighted yeah. with this. Oh, great performance, wonderful play, and um, uh, such a great attitude as well. He said actually that he's been working on that. Um, I mean, if there's one guy that you would say, well, I think your attitude is pretty good, it would be it would be Matt. Yeah, uh, you know, lots of Sheffield steel in that in that boy, uh, and. Um, yeah, he played really well. Just again, loads of loads of mistakes, but that that course can 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 do it to you. But uh, you know, fine performances really, and and two wonderful wonderful players. Uh, Schofield's just missed his uh, birdie putt, so uh, he remains uh, one behind going down the last. Brian Harmon, you know, after his uh, Open win and everything, he he really hangs around, doesn't he, these days? He, and 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 he he plays. He plays a different game to a lot of them, but he knows exactly what he wants to do and, and gets it done. Well, I like Brian Harmon a lot. I thought of all the players today, other than Scheffler, he was swinging the best. Uh, he didn't really hold putts like he can. Um, but it's his kind of golf course, actually. Um, Pete, uh, the course is by, designed by Pete Dye, um, and it looks really American, really angular and artificial. Uh, but actually, Pete Dye based all his, his principles on, on the Scottish courses, and this does relate to Brian Harmon in a minute. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, what Pete Dye did was he visited all the Scottish courses, went to Royal Dornock in, 19, in the 1960s, and he based all his, um, um, his, his design on, on the great courses but he had a very american look and one of the things that he's done at the players is angle the fairways so there's an angle to it there's a big hazard on the inside um, perhaps of the dog leg but if you play safe and you overshoot yeah. because of the angle there's a hazard on the other side as well or there's thick rough on the other side so you can't hedge now for for that to for a big hitter that's kind of a problem because if they go what well, you have to choose a line but you also have to choose a, a distance mm. that you're going to hit it because the fairway is sitting at an angle to you uh, and uh, for a shorter hitter like Brian Harmon I think it might be sort of easier he is a little bit straighter anyway um, but there are fewer fewer decisions and he gets himself into few, in, into less trouble plus an amazing putter and one of the other thing that Pete Dye did. Uh, certainly with this course, he's made you know, in greens that, that had huge, big slopes. So a good putter and a good um, a good chipper yeah. uh, would have a distinct advantage. And, and that's, you know, that's his game. We saw that at Hobby Lake. Uh, and he's a wonderful example of the little guy, which, uh, you know, the successful smaller player that, that doesn't hit it very far. And we thought, you know, with the with the uh, with the equipment hitting the ball so far and all of them going down the gym, we thought that was a thing of the past. It's obviously that it's not. Mm. Um, he's uh, going up the uh, 18th uh, at the moment as well. Um, I, I, had a, I had the privilege, the only time I've been to uh, Sawgrass was, uh, I was over there, uh, John Daly was uh, going to be the marquee name at um, the Oxfordshire for, for one of our, our sort of early season tournaments and uh, they flew me out to interview him and a few others and, I, and Colin Montgomery just turned up for, with Paul Laurie and um, I, I interviewed them walking down the first and then they said what are you doing I said we're just going back after today and they said well if you've got time get rid of your cameras and, and walk around and I walked around with Colin um, and uh, Paul and Colin was on great form as he can be when he's he's not under pressure at times and it was it was just a mean. master class it was extraordinary it really was yes. the two of them and he to be fair he was very generous with his thoughts to Paul Laurie who, who got to that first Par three and just said, I I've got no idea here where I can bail out. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's part of the of the design. I mean, yeah. I, I I quite like it, and I agree completely with what you say about Conor Montgomery. I've done a number of corporate days with him, uh, and I had to interview him and sort of half commentate on an exhibition yeah. match that he did. Um, and he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He wasn't at all what you know people who don't know him might mm. expect. Uh, and it's an absolute delight. Interesting. Um, funny, actually, as well. He had a six yeah. foot putt at one point, and he said, "Oh, you might as well give me this. I never missed these." And then he rolled it in. And um, and Paul Laurie is delightful as well. Yeah, I, I know him from corporate golf days as well. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's fascinating and, and, and really nice. Uh, and again, it appears slightly um, slightly down when he's playing competitive golf. But mm. you know, no, these guys man. are at work. they're at work, aren't they? So yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly that. That's... What are, where are you um, standing now, thinking with the tours coming together, but how the players' championship here and one or two things that have been said by those who who haven't been playing in this tournament that you'd well, expect i think this this is the one that's sort of suffered actually mm -hmm. um 
the, uh, for, for listeners who, who aren't sort of avid golfers, the, the four major championships are the biggest tournaments. This is the fifth, and the tour championship would be the sixth. Yeah. So uh, the tour championship is at the end of the season, and this one's towards the beginning. Uh, it was created, and it is the 50th year of this, uh, although not the 50th year that they played this course. It opened in 1982, so um, they've not played quite so many courses. But they, this was originally... Um, the idea of a guy called Dean Beeman, who was the commissioner of the tour at the time, uh, and they created this event, and then they had this swamp land that they that they found, uh, which they bought for a dollar uh, for the developers next door, and said, "We're going to make this place famous, and you need to give us this ground." And they did, and uh, and so uh, Pete Dye was hired to create this fantastic course that they would have this tournament on. It would be the tour's flagship event. Now. Um, the PGA Tour are in control of who plays, and for years this was the biggest field mm-hmm. and the best paid. I mean, four million pounds, uh, four million dollars this year for the winner. It's always had um, the biggest and the best field, and this year it doesn't because the live yeah. players aren't invited. Now the majors don't have that because they're run uh, by Augusta National, by the RNA for the Open, the USGA for the uh, US Open, and the PGA of America, which is different from the PGA Tour. That's the club pros organization mm-hmm. run the PGA Championship. So the majors can invite who they like and have a qualifying system based on maybe the world rankings if they want or special invites if uh, if people aren't qualified for that mm-hmm. um but this one can't so we're missing um you know dustin johnson patrick reed Bryson DeChambeau, cameron smith and the like uh which has made this a weaker field than it would ordinarily be so um that's a shame um has i mean in the end these things always come down to yeah you know, the four or five players on the last day, uh, and you can't argue with uh, with the quality. Uh, Scotty Scheffler is going to probably win this. I think it uh, looks like it. In year running. Um, Master champion, Wyndham Clark, US Open champion, uh, Brian Harmon, uh, Open champion. It's a pretty tight. I mean, Shao who will be, no doubt, no, labelled now the best player to have never won. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but you can't argue with the quality of the league board. I mean, it's really good, and the quality of the golf as well. And I think... Once you get great players playing a great golf course and it asks them interesting questions, which this course undoubtedly does. Mm. Um, you know, the score has been incredible because it's slightly softer and Pete Dye would have wanted a, yeah. you know, a slightly firmer, hard-running course. Um, but I think this has been a great uh, a great example of the, of the PGA Tour at its absolute best. Uh, you've got great players, great course, uh, and also it's in a, situa- it's in a, a time of the year now uh, reverting back to its original March yeah. date, which sits a lot better. It's a lot better as a preview to the Masters than coming after the Masters. It works the appetite because we know it's not the fifth major. It's the it's 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 the players. It's a yeah. different thing, uh, but it's still a great event, and I like it here a lot more than than when they tried yeah. to put it in, in May, and uh, and it gets right. in it it sits wrong in, at that point. Um, so it's a shame that the, the best players aren't there, and it really has suffered. And hopefully. You know, we are no nearer than when we last spoke to, to getting a, I know. a decision on this. So, um, you know, I, uh, I could, we could only, we could, we could speculate, it would be great fun, but we haven't really got a clue, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, Brian Harmon um, missed a uh, birdie part on the last, so he's going to finish at best on uh, 19 under par, which he, he does, so, which is another great week for him, though, isn't it? Jeffler is the winner in that case, yes. Yeah, I think so. I think that's it. Because uh, well, well done to him. As back-to-back wins, Bay Hill last week. Yeah, yeah. Chef, uh, Chauffle is. Uh, and Chauffle still do it or not? Yeah, he can. He's, he's well. He's three seventeen, and he's he's nineteen under par. But I don't know where he is on that. Oh, he's in the fairway there. I can see him now. Yeah. Okay. So he's still. Yeah, we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves, but um, yeah, but yeah. it doesn't matter. Of course, um, it's not too long, is it? Not just for. Uh, pro golf, but for, you know, you know the, the the golfers now beginning to think with spring here, and you know we're getting through March. For a lot of clubs as well, it's been extraordinary weather in the last month for them. They, I mean, they have been soaking some of these. Uh, yeah, clubs, yeah, they? it's it's been uh, it's been very difficult. I mean, I, I coach a, a lovely golf course in Oxfordshire called Felden Valley, and uh, it is on clay. And uh, for the last two winters, it's been perfectly playable. For this winter, we had a wet October and uh, November, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and it just started. And, and we, you know, we 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 closed quite a lot of time, and it's uh, it's it's real a real shame. We get one nice day, and then we get a day of rain, and it's closed again. So um, it will it will change, and and when it does, the clay sort of firms up. And uh, um, but in in Britain, um, we are blessed actually yeah. with courses that you can go to in in winter. Um, I played another course called Cleve Hill. It's a thousand mm. foot up overlooking Cheltenham. 
um, and uh, it drains beautifully. And, and if you go to the Lynx courses or the Heathland courses uh, around you know, the country, um, then um, then hmm. you can get fantastic uh, turf conditions even in even in winter. Uh, but uh, but even even this year. That, that, I mean, even those courses this year yeah. are, are are struggling. I played at Deal this week at Royal St. Ports, and yeah. uh, you know, even the first couple of holes there were were were, were a little bit wet, mm. um, but it was lovely. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, we, we, there are places where you can get away from your your own club if you are on a clay course. Uh, but it's um, yeah, no, hopefully the, yeah. the rain will stop and we'll be able to get back to normal. Well, um, we're just about out of time. As always, so great to talk to you. Jeremy, uh, we'll talk again very soon. We've got some, a uh, lot of good golf 